Okay. Our scientific secretary, Dr. F. M. Kamaluddin, he will give an overview of this oncology club, about this oncology club. And the agenda, the our the faculties, they are all over the India. And Dr. Palok that created this, and the all the credits goes to Dr. Palok Kupad. And today's the moderator of this session, the Dr. Takulukhi Nayuk. She is the professor gyne oncology and Tutok India. And the faculties today are Dr. Nidesh Shavul. Due to some unavoidable circumstances, Sir is the he's the professor department of radio diagnosis, and she cannot join today. She cannot the present, but he will join with us in this program. Dr. Unurima Patra is junior consultant, and <clears throat> now she is working in Tata Medical Center, Kolkata, India. But he um, uh, was trained in the Tata Medical Memorial Hospital from Mumbai. Dr. Palok is the main the person behind this program. Now she is the associate professor, radio diagnosis, specializing in women's oncoimaging, TMS. Dr. Lokmi Joshri is the senior consultant department of the clinical imaging and intervention radiology, the Kochi, Kerala. The panelists of the today's session are Professor Dr. Omita Moheshwari. All we know about Omita Moheshwari, Madam, she is the professor and head department of Gynae Oncology, TMS. Professor Dr. Uh, Dr. Tapush Kumar Dura is professor and head, head department of Radiation Oncology, Somi Bhapa Cancer Hospital, the uh, Shangurar, and the Mulan Pur, India. Dr. Srikanthoni, and this is also assistant professor in medical oncology in the solid tumor, and also the panelist, Dr. Palak Kupan. The Behind this program, the our always our inspector, our, our scientific secretary, and our the president, Professor Dr. Ms. Heiser, this old man, every day in every program is always with us. And Professor Dr. M. M. Shori Kulalam, sir, is the general secretary of this oncology club. The words can be like X-ray. If you use them properly, they will go through anything. You will read and you acquire. Good relations are like the needles of the cloth. They only meet for the sometimes, but always stay connected. And for this, we can do, make this program. And last but not least, I want to remember you all and invite you all the next program of our the Oncology Club program. After two years, we are going to organize the program, the Bangladesh International Cancer Congress 2022. And it will be in 17th to 18th November in Army Golf Club, Dhaka. Thank you all. Thank you. And now I would like to request our scientific secretary, Dr. A. F. M. Kamaluddin. Okay, hi, sir, okay, sir, now I request our uh, chairperson of the Oncology Club, the president, the two days session, and Professor Dr. A. M. Hi, sir, to um, give us permission and say something about the two days session and about the on this onco imaging series. Sir, please, over to you. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. I'm really happy today to see that we could organize a series of tiny onco imaging. <clears throat> important imaging is a very, very important subject which we need for diagnosis, for biopsy, and for staging, and also for follow-up. My request to all the participants, please attend very, very attentively and try to make things easier for you. You can put questions, any type of questions, make clear your views. That is my suggestion to all of you. And my heartiest congratulations to Dr. Tonak Papad for organizing this thing. Fine session, as I already have heard from Dr. Samatana, the Tata Memorial Hospital and Oncology Club. Hospital, a very old one, very wonderful hospital. I have visited twice there. To organize these things earlier. Now we are, we are very close now, and I think we can organize this in, very, in the future as well. We shall have to try to learn things from them. We shall have to try to our services they are doing. So with all this, with all the participants, all the faculties from India who are helping us, my heartiest thanks and congratulations. 
but without any delay, Dr. Sahana, please start. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Now I would like to request our scientific secretary, Dr. A.F.M. Kamaluddin, to introduce our oncology club. And at last, I want to say that today uh, with me, Dr. Sahana Kalam, will, the rest of the session will be conducted by Dr. Sahana Kalam. Kamaluddin, Bhai, please. Thank you, Shahana. Already you told many things about Oncology Club, and I think many of our, our friends, they know about the club which was started in 1996 under the leadership of our first president, Professor ABMF Karim, who was the Emeritus Professor in the Free University of Amsterdam. But he was the first fellow of Royal College in the Indo-Pak subcontinent. So we all are proud of him because he was the first Royal College fellow. And he started in 1996, and then in 2001, he started the SARC Federation of Oncology, which is still the only SARC platform for oncologists. And 20, on 2012, we lost Professor Karim, sir. And then from there onwards, Professor Hai, sir, is leading us, and still we are working under his leadership. From the first day until today, we are working only with one agenda, and that is the development of manpower. We believe that manpower development is under addressed area in country like us where we need to work. And we are so happy that from the very beginning till now, we are getting support from home and abroad. So in the country, we are getting support. And also from the overseas, we have been working with agencies like IAEA and we are getting friends from India. Like today, we have so many known face whom no more, no more we treat as foreign. We rather treat them like our local colleagues. So the COVID, taught us many things that we can do magic with this virtual thing. And today it's a great day for us because we have moved from treatment to diagnosis and I'm sure this will be quite interesting for us. And with the long heritage of manpower development, this is the beginning. And I, as a scientific secretary, I can say that if we see a good response from our participants, we can arrange similar type of program on coming days, even in our workshop. Congratulations to Shahana and special thanks to Dr. Papat. I heard so much about you. I wish I meet you physically and express my gratitude. I sh how can I finish without saying thanks to Amita and Bhaigya, all the friends, they have been supporting us all the time. And we are enriched with your support. Without you people, we couldn't have reached the new friends and we could not create this networking. So as Shahana said, we are the but like the clock, meet not frequently, but in connected. So we'll be connected in coming days and working together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kamal Bhai. Now we are going to the start the, our the original session. The, our today's first presenter is, was Dr. Nilesh Shagul, but due to some unavoidable circumstances, Sar is unable to present her, give her presentation. And in a, when, instead of him, Dr. Palop, you will cover the first topic. So at first I request our the, the uh, my the colleague, Dr. Farhana Kalam, to introduce Dr. Um, Palop Prabhupada, and she will go through the first and second topics, and third topics will be according to Dr. Onurima. Farhana Kalam, please. She is the junior consultant, is fellow in Ofsani and also fellow in Gaini Oncology National Institute of Cancer Research Center Hospital. Farhana Kalam, over to you, please. Thank you, madam. Slide, please. Slide to share, Corbin, please. Okay. I have, I have already, I have already introduced Obi. Please, go through. Okay, now we, I'd like to request our first speaker, Dr. Palak. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Farhana. Uh, yeah, we also I profusely thank Dr. Shana and Dr. Kamaluddin for so much appreciating uh, this venture of uh, having a series of gynae onco imaging and we are equally likewise happy and fortunate to be on a common platform together and looking to more of these. Um, so I will cover up uh, what we will do. There will be a slight changes. I will cover up for the anatomy for Dr. Nilesh. 
and I would take my topic together. So in half an hour, I would explain the anatomy and cervical imaging in malignancies. And then I would request Dr. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Anurima to take up uh, the third topic. Uh, is my screen seen? Uh, yeah, it's visible. Yes, yes. Sure, all right. Okay, so uh, let me take you through the uh, anatomy part first. Yes, you can. Yeah, so uh, I would discuss the anatomy here and then we would come to the staging of cancer for cervical uh, malignancies. Uh, Post-therapy assessment uh, that we see either on surgery or on radiation. Rule of MRI and CT, so basically cross-sectional imaging and an ideal reporting checklist. So this is the uh, sequence that we see on an MRI. So what is the anatomy that we are seeing here? The first image that we see on the left is the sagittal sequence. And the one on the right is the axial section. This is CT, uh, this is an MRI. So I believe there are a lot of gynecologists here. So I would stick adhere more to the basics. So how do you differentiate a CT scan and an MRI if you're just shown one film or a one cut that the patient comes to you? The first thing, look at the bones. The bones are all white on a CT scan and you don't see that high density structures on an MRI, okay? So that's that's your first uh, point taker. So now we are looking at this MRI. Uh, this is like our anatomy uh, textbook that we have studied. So we know this will be an axial section like how you see on the CT scan. And an MRI gives you the sagittal section. Uh, either we take a sagittal section or we reformat a sagittal section. So in a CT scan, when we're taking an axial section, uh, we take thin cuts and we ask for it to be reformatted. And we get a good thin section imaging on the formatted plane. In an MRI, what happens is if we reformat, uh, the sections are thicker. So in a CT, if you're taking slices at every one or one and a half to two millimeters, uh, generally one, 1 1.5. In an MRI, you may have a larger distance between two slices. So whenever you have larger distance between two slices and we get that to be reformatted, we don't get a crisp image, which is why we need to take a sagittal plane separately. An MRI takes much more longer also because you take vis a vis CT scan, which just takes one thin cut and then you can reformat the way you want. Can we reformat an MRI sequence? Yes, we can. So that happens when we take the post contrast imaging. Those sections are taken at very thin consecutive slices, 1 mm gap, and those can be reformatted to give a fair, equal accuracy of the image quality. Okay, so now let us look at the sagittal section. So we do identify it from the sacrum bone over here behind. Uh, coming anterior to that, this little gray structure over here is the rectum and the anal junction. Coming anteriorly, this stripe would be the vaginal stripe. And we see there's like a chalice-like cup over here. We have the anterior vaginal wall and the fornix. And the posterior wall goes higher and higher. And this is the posterior wall and the fornix. Coming yet anteriorly, we see the bladder. In this patient, the bladder is completely collapsed. So there is a little white urine that you see inside the bladder. And then the bladder is curving up in front of the uterus. Still more anteriorly, we have the pubic symphysis. And then we have the anterior abdominal wall. So this is a sagittal section. What is the gray structure seen here? These are the small bowel loops which are sitting atop the uterus. Now, how do you identify which sequence is it? So since you all are gynecologists and you all will be dealing with the pelvic imaging, look at the bladder, all right? If you see urine, which is white, and most of the structures are nicely seen as grays and whites, then this is a T2-weighted image. Why am I saying that is the first thing you can see is overall, is it is all the background white color or is it black? So the fat appears white, on T1 and T2 sequences, all right? But then we have a fat suppressed sequence, which is a stir sequence. All the fat gets suppressed, so it becomes black, black all right? But however, uh, we do have uh, the structures which are fluid containing, which start appearing white. So when you have a whitish background, this is fat. So this will either be a T1 or a T2 weighted image. After that, go straight to the bladder and try to look for the urine intensity. If this is black, 
or dark gray, this is going to be a T1 weighted sequence. If the urine is white, because fluids are white, this will be a T2 weighted sequence. Okay, so we have we know now how to identify the T1 and the T2. Then they take a stir sequence. Why is a stir sequence taken? That is when the fat is suppressed. So if you want to rule out a fat component within a lesion, that is where it helps. And uh, sometimes the metastasis in the bones or the marrow changes in the bones are more highlighted on a stir sequence. And tumors and cancers in general are more brighter on the stir sequence. So we come to a T1, T2 and a stir. Which sequence is used uh, best for seeing the anatomy? And that is a T2 weighted sequence. In T1 weighted, everything is almost gray. So the fat is white and most other structures are green except for blood, fat so and certain acute stages of hemorrhage. Uh, but in the T2, we see shades of gray and it is the shades of gray that help us to diagnose and see the extent of disease. So we have the pre-contrast. Then there is functional imaging in which we do diffusion and we do uh, post-contrast imaging. A uh, few sequence I'll show you in one of the cases so that will explain. But what the basic principle is, uh, what is diffusion? We take, um, let's say you have a small box, which is packed with marbles and it has only 10 marbles in a big box. So you put those 10 marbles and there is a lot of, and you pour water, the water can move around everywhere. So what is moving around everywhere? Let's consider the marbles are cells and the water is the intercellular space. So if you have a lot of intercellular space, there is a free motion, which is possible, which is the Brownian motion for the molecules. And that means that there is a good enough room for everybody to move. But what happens is if this becomes into a, turns into a cancer. So those 10 cells have now grown into 1000 cells. So in that little box, if I'm putting 1000 cells and I pour in water, the water does not move in as freely because it is a tight packed compartment. So what has happened? The movement of that water has been restricted. So the Brownian motion of the molecules in the body has been restricted. And that is what we call as restricted diffusion. Okay, it is a sequence with a very horrible resolution. You do not see the nice structures very well, but it's about getting used to it to then identify the abnormal areas. Now, the diffusion sequence always goes in pair or hand in hand with something called as a ADC sequence. So when you when the patient comes to you either with a CD or films, you see there is a one blackish area and one whitish area with a very grainy uh, appearance. The resolution is not good. That is likely to be diffusion. It will be written on that DWI. So if you see something which is white on diffusion sequence, we see that this is restricted diffusion and we see an ADC. If something on that ADC is dark enough and black, so if there is a corresponding match of a white which looks black on an ADC, that is restricted diffusion. So which is why uh, when a patient comes to you with a report, you may not have all the films. So it's nice to read the text of the report also apart from just the impression. I'm sure all of you all read the impression, the final line and do not read the entire text. But sometimes it helps because the, the, the faint signs and everything may not be available on a film, but the radiologist who's reported it will be looking into all, all of these things and uh, putting down in the paper. Okay, so this is about your basic MRI. We spoke of the sequences before contrast, the functional imaging, that component is a diffusion component and a post-contrast component. So what happens? We give IV contrast to the patient. It is different from CT contrast. Yes? It's, it's just noise. Go ahead, yeah. Okay. So in CT, we have a different contrast and on an MRI, we have a different contrast. So when this contrast is administered, there is something called as dynamic sequence. So you all know about the triphasic scans that happen, an arterial venous scan, a portovenous scan. So one contrast, which is moving in the body, in the vascular system and then to the tissues. And we take multiple series of imaging. So there is an early phase, there is a middle phase, there is a late phase. That's a triphasic phase in a CT. In an MRI, what we do is we call it a dynamic sequence. So the dynamic sequence starts early with an arterial phase. And then we, we take like a series of six and seven sequences through and through that whole Im area is imaged. So what we see is we see how the contrast has come into the blood vessels. 
it is now perfusing into the tumor or to the normal body tissues and then from there it is now being taken up by the capillaries and into the veins and there is some amount of tissue which stays a contrast which stays in the organ and the veins have also now started to pacify so we see this whole gamut of a vascular flow or a functional flow and that can be seen on a map so we can have a graphic curve, which also I will show you as in when I show you a case. So the graphic curve will tell me how rapidly the contrast has come in, how rapidly it is washing out. So the rate at which these changes happen, tell us something about the type of biology of the tumor that we are seeing. Is something very aggressive? Is something likely to be benign? So uh, reporting is actually like a puzzle and we fit each piece each jigsaw piece to get the final picture, which always needs to be correlated with pathology. And it begins only with your clinical impression. So we somehow form a bridge between y'all and the pathologists. So let me tell you how is the uterus that is seen on MRI. So as I said, this is a T2-weighted image. And the other thing I said is the resolution is most beautifully seen on a T2-weighted image because we see the shades of gray. All right. Everything on a T1 will be like this. But on a T2, we see these shades of gray. So what are the shades? Let us look at the uterine body on the top. And inferiorly, we have the cervix. Now, the uterine body has an outer erosal kind of a surface. We have an outer myometrium and an inner myometrium. So, the outer myometrium usually has more water component. So, it is more brighter fluid and tumors tend to be brighter on a T2-weighted image. So, because there is more water content, it is brighter. So, we see this as a brighter area. Coming down, you see a little darker strip. This is the inner myometrium. It is also called as a junctional zone. Here, there is a compact arrangement of the tissue. The water component is less. Hence, it is less gray. So, this is going to be a little darker. So that is the inner myometrium. Now we come down. This is the endocervical junction. What do we see in the endometrial cavity? There's a thin little strip of gray tissue, a gray shade seen here. This is the apos mucosa of the endometrial cavity. So let's come down along the endocervical junction. The endometrial uh, lining continues down as the mucosa lining of the endocervix. The inner myometrium continues down as a part of the inner layer of the cervix and predominantly forms a cervical stroma. The outer myometrium does continue down, but it is much more attenuated. And then we have the outer margin of the uterus. So this is the posterior lip of the cervix. Anteriorly, we have the anterior lip of the cervix. And it is very nicely, beautifully nestled or nested in, I would say, the chalice of the vaginal cup. So the fornix is going to be here at the junction between the um, vaginal wall and the cervix. Okay, that's the anterior fornix. And this would be the posterior fornix. Now, we do not see the fornix in a state like this. So what we do is we take a uh, lignocaine jelly and that is introduced into the vaginal cavity and that distends the vaginal cavity. So with that, the, the vaginal cavity is now nicely seen as a white structure because of the fluid in it and the opposed vaginal fornices open up. So they get distended. So what is the advantage? If there is a tumor which is involving the lip going into the fornix but not involving the vaginal wall, the Staging changes and helps you to prognosticate and eva accordingly evaluate the patient for surgery. This is the axial section. In the axial section, uh, anteriorly, posteriorly. Anteriorly, we see that there is an anterior abdominal wall. We have the bowel here, a, a small bowel loop partially. This is an averaging of a bowel and a wall of the bladder, which is looking dark because it is just cut through that level where the bladder would just be folded upon itself. This is urine within the bladder. Here we have the cervix and the vaginal component seen in an axial section. So this section would be somewhere over here. All right. There is no distension by the vaginal for, uh, fluid jelly seen over here in this image. What we see laterally is the parametrium. What we see posterior is the, is the rectum. All right. And we have the sacral bone here and we have the lateral uh, iliac bones here. And what do we see here? The obturator muscle. This is a lateral pelvic wall. 
and these are the external iliac vessels and these are the internal iliac vessels all right in the axial section again you see the darker area over here which would be the cervical stromal part the uh, the little gray structure here is the endocervical mucosal lining and inside here we see is the fluid a little minimal endocervical fluid now planning an mri so what is important is uh, we know by anatomy that this a line like this would be the horizontal plane or an axial plane. If I take an axial cut of the uterus along this line, what would I see? I will see a part of the uterine body. Then I will see some part of the muscle. Then I will see a very narrow anterior cervical lip. And I will see a larger ovoid posterior cervical lip. And then this. The anatomy is distorted. All right. And the uterus can be anti-verted and anti-flexed to varied angles. So, which is why it is important that you must tell your technologist that you have to take the planes along the organ axis. So, the axis by organ, if you should not take the planes along the uterine body. If you want to see the endometrium, you take the plane along the uterine body. That's your organ of interest. If you want to see the cervix, then you take the plane as the organ of interest. And the cervix is tilted in this patient. So you customize or personalize the plane and the acquisition will go perpendicular to a line which is passing between the two cervical lips. So this is the angle along which we will acquire to get a true axial plane. If you take an axis like this, this is how you will get a nice oval cervix seen in the axial cut. So, um, moving on, I would like to show the anatomy in the coronal plane. So, we let's move according to the sequences from posterior to anterior aspect. We have the rectum seen posteriorly over here going down to the anorectal junction. That's the levator in eye muscles. And we are for, again following the rectum. We see some part of a soft tissue here. We don't know whether this will be the bowel or that will be the uterus. We shall see. We have the sacral bone and the iliac bones on the side and the two femori. Okay, so that was a uterine body, which was a uterine myometrium, all right? The myometrium looks like a blob of gray structure. But when we come anteriorly, we start seeing a small amount of endometrial fluid within. And we start seeing the inner junctional zone. And we see the outer myometrium, which is more gray. This little dark part would be the junction of the endocervical area, which is more of a tight stromal component. And somewhere down here would be your cervical component. So let's let's go ahead. And this is what we see. The uterus is now coming anteriorly. We're seeing the whole structure. And what do we see here? This is the level of the uterine artery. So let us follow this structure. And as you see, the uterine artery is beautifully seen to extend around and it was branching over here. This is on the left and this is on the right. It is difficult to take a complete axial plane to see both the arteries in the same section. But we see the, uh, the iliac branch is coming here and then the branch off here. And this is the arterial supply to the uterus. All right. So then next we come to the axial section to decide the how do we define the parametrium. So we can draw uh, two parallel lines. Imagine them passing through an arbitrary imaginary plane along the anterior and the posterior lip of the cervix, and then we drop two uh, two oblique lines along the path of the uh, lumbosacral ligaments. And what would be on the lateral side would be your lateral parametrium, and then you have the anterior and the posterior parametrium. Uh, the anterior vesicle space and the posterior uh, vesicle space or the rectovesicle pouch is quite, they are opposed structures. Uh, now, what is nicely seen as the lateral parametrium and we see whether it is confined to the medial half or to the lateral half and involving the lateral pelvic wall. So, everything has a prognostic significance. But what I would like to say is that this is actually not a true anatomical plane. So the way we see the parametrium, this is not, there is no plane sitting for the surgeon to look into when a surgery is being done. So we will have some correlates to that. So let us imagine the patient to be lying in the position like this and the uterus has been dissected partially and it is reflected off. We have the broad ligament uh, area over here. Anteriorly, 
is a reflection of our round ligament and posteriorly is the infundibular pelvic ligament. And this, uh, the plane which follows between this, this would be considered as a plane of the lateral uh, parametrium. Uh, we have certain other images. I would thank Dr. Amita Maheshwari for sharing these wonderful pictures which make our anatomy so good and easy to understand. The uterus is still pushed to the left and on further dissection, we are seeing the ureter coursing over here. The vessels from here would divide into the external iliac vein and the artery and the internal iliac vein and the artery. And further dissection is done deeper down into the parametrium. So parametrium is a dead space, a surgical dead space. But radiologically, it is seen as just loose tissue and fat and it appears white. And we can identify changes of tumor growing within that area. Again, on further dissection, so with the uterus here, Anteriorly, we'll have the paravesical space. Posteriorly, we have the pararectal space because the bladder would be here, the rectum would be here. And we have the cardinal ligament over here, very beautifully dissected out. And further uh, inferiorly, if we see the uterus has been deflected anteriorly, and this would be the rectum. So we have posterior to the uterus and the rectum is a rectovaginal space. We have the ligament coursing along and lateral to it would be the pararectal space. This is the ureter. The cardinal ligament would be here. And we have the paravesical space would be anterior to this. A drone view again to show if the bladder is anterior and the, you, you push the uterus behind and this would be the cervix and the enfolded uterus in continuity and little dead space seen here would be the vesico, the vesico cervical space and the ligaments. So uh, that was about the parametrium. Uh, obturator fossa, again, we see, uh, we just write that there are obturator nodes, but uh, it requires a huge amount of surgical dissection and going deep down to actually look for the exploration of the presence of an obturator node in the obturator fossa. So it is, when it is so surgically challenging, it is important for us to better characterize the nodal assessment and the parametral assessment to our best abilities. So how a normal node looks like. So this is a post-contrast image. So as I said, post-contrast images will be fat suppressed. So all the white fat that I showed earlier is all now dark and black because the fat has been suppressed. So the structures now start seeing up. So if this was a stir, I would see fluid and tumor as bright. In a post-contrast, we see areas which is enhancing as bright. So we have the external iliac vein and artery over here, which is enhancing the internal iliac vessels would be here and what is this little white structure this is a normal reactive node there would be a hilum and this is a definitely reactive node this would be the enhancement of the myometrium and then we have the bowel here and the bladder here so uh, what is the nomenclature of the nodes and what is a region of uh, location or the google map for the nodes okay so we have the common iliac nodes which would be higher up um, uh, coming down, we have the external iliac nodes. These could either be lateral, middle or medial. Now, as we course superiorly, the medial iliac node is a uh, medial external iliac node is not very distingu distinguishable from the obturator node. So these are the obturator vessels. So a node around this would be called as the obturator node. So when we are a little on the higher side, we can have a common nomenclature for the posterior external iliac node or the obturator node is the same thing. Just as the common iliac nodes uh, bifurcate, we have the hypogastric node, which is sitting below the junction of the two. And then we have the external iliac anteriorly. Okay. And then we have the internal iliacs. So this would be an internal iliac nodes. And then we have the anterior sacral, lateral sacral and the presacral node. Now, what is the protocol? So the patient can say fasting for four to six hours or uh, fasting is not very mandatory. We are trying to get down our system to no fasting because by the time the patient comes, changes, weights, puts an IV, it automatically takes about two hours of waiting time. 
antiperistaltic agent uh, may or may not be given is optional. Especially when you're looking at the cervix, you don't have any bowel artifacts coming down to your cervical region. So we may not need an antiperistaltic agent. The bladder must be emptied prior to the scan. So by the time the patient, uh, and the patient should be hydrated well enough. So hydrated patient with an empty uh, bladder, by the time they come for the scan and the scan happens, the bladder is kind of optimally distended. So half an hour prior to the scan, they can empty their bladders. A consent, of course, a dedicated coil. The jelly is very important and I'll show you in some cases. So a small field of view imaging is important where you have smaller areas covered. They look, um, they look, uh, seem to have better resolution than seeing the entire pelvis together. So that's important, especially for small lesions. And we have the diffusion, T1 and the post-contrast sequences. So now coming to the staging of the cervix. So, uh, Stage T1, of course, the less than 5 millimeter microscopic tumors we do not see on an MRI. What we sometimes occasionally we can see when there is a larger superficial component and less than 5 millimeter invasive component into this uh, invasive component would still be seen as a 1A disease. 1B is when it is 5 millimeters or more up to 2 centimeters. 1B2, 2 to 4 and 1B3 is more than equal to 4 centimeters. So let us look at this patient here. And this is the beauty of the jelly. So when I spoke about the anatomy, um, let me tell you again, this sequence would be a T2 weighted sequence. How do we look at that? The fat is bright. First point. Second point, look at the urine in the bladder. It is bright. So this should be a T2 weighted sequence. In a T2 weighted sequence, let us see the jelly should also be bright. Okay. So posteriorly where we have the jelly, we see that it is a nice bright structure. So this is a jelly, anterior vaginal wall and the posterior vaginal wall. The jelly is now, it has been pushed up. This is the fornicial area anteriorly and posteriorly it has not really gone up and opened up the fornix. But definitely we see a very smooth, good posterior vaginal wall and the posterior part of the cervix. We are not worried about this. So we see this apple-like lesion seen over here myometrium posterior cervical lip anterior cervical lip and there's almost a bite like partially endophytic partially exophytic tumor this is a very small tumor this would be about eight nine millimeters in size it is not infiltrating the anterior vaginal wall or the fornix why because i can see the black serosal line the ectocervical line seen very nicely so this is a uterus confined tumor a very low disease tumor Another example where we have the jelly which is beautifully going into the fornix posteriorly and anteriorly. So what's happening here? We see uh, that there is no involvement of the vagina. Per vaginally, we, uh, you would be able to palpate that there is an abnormality. There is a mass. You can see the mass, but you would not know the inner extent. So the depth of this lesion is where is seen very well on an MRI. It can be seen very well on an ultrasound also, but not on a CT scan. So when we see cases like this, this could have been a 1B2. But if you measure it and it is more than 4 centimeters, it would be a 1B3. Uh, an example where the jelly helps us again. So there's this large more than 4 centimeter polypoid tumor, bladder, white. This is the uterus, uterine body. Endometrium is hyper intense over here. It's because of hematometra. And this is a uterine body. This There is a small little fibroid in the lower part. And there is a large polypoidal lesion which is coming into the uh, vaginal uh, and the cervical uh, lumen. So we see there is a little bright fluid stripe seen all around, which means that this is not infiltrating the vaginal wall, though it is very close in contact with it. But we have a good space around, no involvement of vagina, more than four centimeters. Again, per vaginally, it would look like a very horrible mass, which is coming right up to the vagina. And the fingers may not be insinuating along the lesion to look at the vaginal wall infiltration. Or even if this is free, we would not know whether the vaginal wall is involved here or not. So this is how uh, an MRI can delineate it so well. This is a post-contrast delayed image and this is a hematometra in the axial section seen in the uterus. Not tumors which grow beyond the uterus. So we have like upper two-thirds vagina, uh, 2A and 2B is parametral infiltration. So this is the 2A1 disease where the tumor is involving the cervical lip and the vaginal wall. It is very classically involving both anterior and posterior wall. Such a tight stenosis that there is a significant hematometra which is even larger than the tumor. It enhances less 
Okay, it is darker than the enhancing myometrium here. All right, and this is the tumor in the sagittal section and in the axial section. These are all post contrast sequences. This is the diffusion that I was talking about. In diffusion, the bladder is black. Okay, B is black. Bladder is black in a diffusion sequence. And uh, these gray areas are the normal soft tissue diffusion. But this little area is a little brighter. So this has to be combined by seeing if this is dark on an ADC sequence. The fluid in the bladder, urine is going to be bright over here. So it's a reversal phenomena. So the black becomes white and the white becomes black. Then it is a true restricted diffusion, which is usually in favor of a malignancy. I will not get into its exceptions right now. Okay. Uh, this is just a uh, color coding to show the restriction. Uh, this is a tumor which is involving the upper two thirds of the vagina for sure, a very large tumor that will be 2A2. Here, there is a tumor which is infiltrating into the lateral parametrium for sure. And uh, it is also extending up to the iliac wall. So if you see, there is reflection along this and there is this serious change happening and stopping at a reflection of the uh, peritoneal part. This will be tumor extending to the lateral pelvic wall, even if it is about four or five millimeters away from the external iliac vessels. Uh, when there is multiple extension coming and stopping across an arbitrary line, it is quite uh, likely to be considered as an extension to the lateral pelvic wall for the radiation purpose. Coming to stage three, so uh, this is a tumor which is involving right down up to the lower vaginal wall. So this is a uh, stage three lesion. Uh, we have the tumor over here showing extensive parametrial infiltration on both sides and here also it has a similar stopping along a plane which is very close to the vessels over here. This would also be parametrial infiltration to the lateral pelvic wall. There is secondary hydroureter because of the lateral pelvic parametrial infiltration and uh, compared to the ureter on the opposite side, this one is more dilated. And look at another section where it is going definitely up to the vessels and also up to the, the distended ureter, hydro ureter on both sides, which is blocked by the parametrial disease here and on the opposite side. And this is the uterus in the midline with extensive uh, involvement along its uh, lateral structures. A CT scan, as I said, the bones are seen white and rest of the structures are usually gray. This is a CT scan. And uh, for such patients with extensive pelvic lateral perimetral wall in involvement, if you feel clinically, this patient has involvement right up to the, uh, it, she definitely has involvement of the parametrium. She is on MRI. I don't waste money and time for her. Uh, she can easily go ahead with a CT scan because it's on the staging and whether you are how much radiation, where the radiation dose and for chemotherapy first. All right. So a CT scan very much does the trick very well. This is tumor. Uh, there is infiltration over here seen even on the CT and into the rectum and there is secondary hydroureter. A stage 3C, uh, 3C, it would be if there is lymph nodal involvement. So if the same parametrial infiltration was with a suspicious iliac node uh, metastatic involvement, then that would upgrade to a 3C. All right. Stage 4 is when there is involvement of the bowel uh, bladder wall. So uh, we see that there is some amount of high signal intensity over here, but there is a black line which is separating. So this tumor is not actually going into this. This is a false thickening of the bladder wall, which is called as the bullous edema. But if you have frank infiltration into the bladder wall, that would be a stage 4A and a 4B similarly for the rectum. This is a stage of metastasis where uh, we have bone lesions over here and there are lung lesions and lesions in the spine. Uh, adenopathy, regional adenopathy, which we said uh, is of a, uh, it, it is usually involving the perivisceral iliac nodes and the common iliac nodes. The paraotic goes to a stage 3C2. So it is considered as a non regional as far as the pelvic nodes are considered. We do measure the short axis dimension and the morphology is more important. So we have to look for nodes well because that will upstage the disease even with the same loco regional extent. So uh, this is just about uh, 
a situation where you may have extensive lateral pelvic wall infiltration and uh, there would be no ureteric involvement. Like over here, there's definite lateral pelvic wall extension here and extension over here also. However, there was absolutely no hydroureter. So presence of a hydroureter saying it is a lateral parameter involvement is not always correct on an ultrasound. So whenever uh, there, is a, there is an equivocal value of whether local staging is going to be helpful, we must go ahead with an MRI and not uh, just be happy with an only an ultrasound. Of course, that is if an MRI is available and feasible because we don't stop take, uh, the treatment for the patient. This is the post RT placement. We have the brachytherapy rods placed here. And then this is a tumor, which is very dark. So this is how the RT planning on an uh, MRI is done. This is a Foley catheter into the bladder. In the axial section, we see this dark rod seen here. And this is also the uh, the, the radiation uh, brachytherapy rod. This is a CT-based planning. Uh, this is an example of how an obvious tumor, which is seen here. Uh, and this is the same tumor here. And in the coronal plane, it has a little parametral infiltration perhaps on this side. And she undergoes radiation as a treatment of cure. And the whole thing has undergone fibrosis. And even in the axis section, there is no evidence of any residual disease. And that is a very good cure. Uh, this is an example where the patient had already undergone surgery and post-surgery she had uh, come with a recurrence and the bladder is seen here, the bowel is seen here, the vaginal vault is, is not delineated over here, but it is replaced by an abnormal soft tissue which is infiltrating into the rectum, into the bladder and a very bad recurrence. She was given radiation and post-RT, the beautiful um, response is seen over here. This is the vault area, the bowel has healed, the uh, the bladder wall has healed some residual tissue, but it was not looking like an active, um, active aggressive disease. It looked like a responded disease. It did not show much enhancement. This is in the axial section. We see the response very well. Uh, this is an example of uh, for the CT where you see the metastatic node has now come down to this. This was radiation given for palliative treatment. And it has a good response to the adenopathy and the hydrometra. Spectroscopy can be done sometimes. So we have an elevated choline peak over here, which was completely stunted, but we do not use it often because we have other parameters also telling us whether there is disease or not. Um, an example where uh, this patient over here, she had uh, an extensive disease, again, recurrence in the vaginal vault post-surgery. And uh, this is how the axial cuts are. And post-radiation, everything is gone, except for there's this little high residual bright area seen. And when we give post-contrast, it has a very classical submucosal enhancement and edematous layer. So this is more of a post-RT change of edema rather than tumor, which was seen inside the vaginal area earlier before the RT. There are complications where you might, the patient might say that there is now complaining of urine passing through her vaginal opening and there can be occult fistulous communications. So this looked like a partially distended bladder, but a good delayed scan or a retrograde frilly. Just wait for 15 minutes and take an additional screening and we see the contrast coming out through fistulous tract into the vaginal cavity. Uh, an example where uh, we see uh, nothing else, just routine on a post-RT follow-up, but complaining of low gluteal region pain on both the sides. And she had this low signal intensity line seen here and over here and a little high area. Look at the stir, the fat uh, suppressed sequence that I was talking about. So the bones are black because the fat in the marrow is suppressed, but this is an abnormal area here. And over here, so this is all edematous changes. These are insufficiency fractures, bilaterally symmetric. This is a post-radiation change. Uh, so it's it's important to know because first it has to be seen. And if it is seen, it need not be given as metastasis. Uh, this is an example of how there was a reference which was picked up even on CT. And this is just to show how on a CT, the bones which are gray are now much more black or because there is fatty marrow replacement after a radiotherapy. The rule of MRI, I would just sum up, is to have a good local regional extent. So if there is a patient who has a large disease uh, on your clinical examination, parametric involvement, which is definite, she can go ahead with a CT unless you want to do an MRI-based planning. So she would not need a CT for diagnosis and staging. 
All right. But if there is a patient who has an equivocal finding, we must go ahead with an MRI whenever available. If not available, then a good transvaginal ultrasound and clinical examination can dictate the further treatment. Role of CT, as I said, is more for overall distance staging as well as larger disease. Uh, the role of dynamic MRI, uh, just so over here again, we have a nice frond-like polypoidal growth coming out of the cervix. The vaginal jelly is beautifully outlining both the anterior and the posterior fornites. It's telling us that this is a uterus-confined disease, cervical-confined disease. The axis section is also well showing the tumor. We know these are vessels, but we don't know what's happening here and whether there is any parametrial spread because that is now going to change the disease management. So coming down to the uh, dynamic post. Uh, okay, no, I think I just probably missed one image. But when you do see the dynamic post contrast images, all these vessels, they start lighting up. So the some of them will brighten up in the arterial phase. The others brighten up the, in the venous phase. So there are venous channels and arterial dots. So all of these are seen enhancing as one area. And the tumor is enhancing a little differently. So that tells us that this demarcation is done on a dynamic post contrast. It improves the sensitivity and specificity to some extent of telling whether there is parametral infiltration or not. For frank infiltration, we don't need dynamic scans. Uh, just a last image to show, just to show how these tumors are avid on a PET CT when it is used for staging purpose. But nonetheless, lesions of this size are also obviously going to be seen on a chest abdo pelvis. So uh, each patient needs to be judiciously asked for the corresponding imaging required. This was that dynamic sequence that I was talking about. So uh, you see this uh, cervical tumor here, and these are the arterial uh, enhancements over here. And as I successively go, the venous channels also start coming up. And here, see here, look at the veins here and the veins here. And look at these, these are different. So these are arteries, and then there is venous enhancement. But that area that we were seeing over here, that is not enhancing. And that is likely to be a part of the vascular plexus. And there was no tumor infiltration into the parametry. So the checklist would consist of the size, the site, morphology, approximate percent of stromal involvement. It is a very arbitrary and subjective parameter. Vaginal involvement, parametrial involvement, and extent, lateral pelvic wall, bladder and rectosigmoid colon, and how much. Thank you, Dr. Palok, for your very nice lecture on anatomy and definitely on staging of CSRVs. Uh, now would like, I would like to request our next speaker, Dr. Ono Rima Patra, for her lecture. Her topic is role of imaging in malignancies of the uterine corpus and its implication and management. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, madam. And uh, can you see my screen as well? Yes, yes. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Palak and the team uh, for organizing this. And also, I would like to thank you for uh, making me a part of this. I would today uh, be talking about malignancies of uterine corpus and implications on management. So most of my talk is going to be on endometrial cancer, which is the most common malignancy of the uterine body. I will briefly uh, touch upon the histological classification of endometrial cancer. Uh, I'll talk about the basic anatomy of uterus, which partly has already been covered by Dr. Palak. Uh, I'll talk about the different cross-sectional imaging options with emphasis on MRI, uh, the latest FIGO staging, and how staging affects the management options. So this we already know that endometrial cancer is the leading gynecological cancer in the developed world. And in developing countries, it is the second most common cancer after cervix. Uh, the peak incidence is typically 60 to 70 years in postmenopausal women who present with postmenopausal bleed uh, in the background of certain risk factors such as um, high estrogen exposure, tamoxifen, uh, 
uh, intake, uh, nulliparity, obesity, etc. But in up to 30% of cases uh, can be seen in premenopausal ladies as well. Uh, this is essentially a screenshot of the two histological types. Why we need to know it is because one type is more aggressive compared to the other type and the management, the treatment options are different for both. Type 1, which is the more common one, is also known as the endometrioid variety. These are the low-grade ones, the less aggressive ones, and fortunately the more common ones as well. The risk factors for this is estrogen excess, obesity, infertility, et cetera. And that's why this happens in the background of endometrial hyperplasia. Typically, it involves younger women, so early postmenopausal or premenopausal ladies. These are essentially low grade. So grade one and grade two are the common types of endometrioid variety. There is a grade three variety as well. But when it is a grade three variety of endometrioid, it goes into the type two. And these, this has got a better prognosis. The type 2, on the other hand, this includes the non-endometrioid varieties, which are the clear cell, the serous, papillary, carcinosarcomas, etc. These are, are basically these do not express estrogen receptors, and they occur in older women, postmenopausal ladies, and these are high grade. So these are the more aggressive subtypes, and these are the uh, patients who have a poorer prognosis. And when uh, histopathology is suggesting a type 2 non-endometrioid variety, that is when we have to look for endometrial uh, myometrial invasion uh, more carefully, extra uterine disease more carefully. So uh, the prognostic factors, so there are certain factors that decide the patient prognosis once they are diagnosed with an endometrial cancer. These include certain factors that are picked up on pathology, that is the histological grade I just mentioned, uh, lymphovascular invasion. The last three, the depth of myometrial and the cervical invasion, the size of tumor and nodes are also important prognostic factors. And these are decided on imaging. And these factors, so these prognostic factors basically correlate with uh, poor survival, a higher tumor grade and presence of distant metastasis when we have these factors present. So if we have node positive, either regional or distant node positive, if the tumor is tumor, tumor size, big tumor sizes, or if there is a presence of uh, more than 50% myometrial invasion, et cetera. And if there's a histological type 2, that is the non-endometrial type, these are poor prognostic factors and these patients are likely to do, do poorly. So why do we need imaging? Imaging is essentially to decide the management. The treatment options will depend upon the tumor stage and the type and the grade. The type and the grade are decided on pathology and MR comes into play when uh, we need to stage the disease. So role of MR is uh, is to uh, basically decide if there is myometrial invasion present or not, if there is extra uterine invasion present or not, if uh, if so, which ultimately translates to whether the patients is going patients are going to require a nodal dissection and whether the patients are going to require an adjuvant therapy. The aim is to overtreat patients who have a low risk <laughs> disease. Sorry, that means uh, patients who have a low stage or they have a, a good subtype histologically. So the indications of MRI, uh, NCCN now recommends MRI for these indications. One, assessment of myometrial invasion. Second, to find out the origin of tumor, whether it is arising from the cervix or the endometrium. Third, when fertility sparing treatments are being planned for endometrial cancer. Fourth, uh, to rule out any cervical invasion. And five, when you have an aggressive histology, which is the type two histology. So how to scan properly already covered in the previous talk. I'll just quickly go through this. So we scan uh, patients with an empty bladder. Best the, that they evacuate the bladder about 30 minutes prior to the, uh, uh, the MRI. Then pervaginal jelly is optional. For endometrial cancer detection, uh, I mean staging on MRI, we do not really require pervaginal jelly. This is only required when the clinicians have a palpating some tumor which is protruding through the work vagina, uh, I mean, protruding through the cervix into the upper vagina, and they want to look for involvement of the cervix and the vagina. That's the only indication of giving a jelly. But otherwise, if these areas are clinically free, or if there's an uh, ultrasound or any other imaging done elsewhere, which mentions that the disease is limited to the endometrium and not going down into the cervix and vagina, we can avoid giving this jelly. Third is the antispasmodic agents. This is optional, but better to give them because uh, 
uh, uh, these will take care of the peristaltic movements and we get good quality images and menstrual cycle we do not really need to uh, do these scans in any particular phase of men menstrual cycle so uh, the endometrium can be in any phase what sequences are acquired, I will just quickly go through this. So T1 is not really required for staging. The only role of T1 is to look for any hemorrhage or to give an overview of how the bones look like, whether we are going to find any bone metastasis or also to look for nodes. But these things can be well seen on T2 as well. The more important sequences are the small field of view T2 sequences. So these are acquired in three orthogonal planes. These are small field of view. We uh, acquire them along and parallel to the uh, plane of the uterus. These are the oblique, sagittal, axial, and coronal, the most important three sequences when it comes to the local staging of MRI. We also take large field of view T2 actual, with, uh, which is basically to assess the nodes. And this has to include the paraiotic region and not just the pelvis. Diffusion are typically uh, acquired with high B value of at least 800 to 1000. And then of course, we do the dynamic contrast images, uh, imaging as well. I will show some examples in the subsequent slides. So this is the imaging plane. The plane of acquisition is very, very important. I'm just trying to show you how we acquire the small field of view oblique sequences here. And <laughs> for that, it is very important to remember that the orientation of the uterus can vary. And the technicians who are performing the scan should be aware of that so that they can plan the oblique sections according to the plane of the uterus. First, a sagittal image is acquired. And depending upon the plane of the endometrium or basically the angulation of the uterus, the oblique axial and the oblique coronal images are acquired. Now, why is this important? This is important because uh, this optimal plane of imaging is important to assess the depth of myometrial invasion. That's one of the most important piece of information that we are expected to provide. And if we do not uh, acquire these oblique sequences in the three orthogonal planes along and perpendicular to the axis of the uterus, then we will not be able to assess the interface, the endometrial myometrial interface correctly. <laughs> So uh, this is dynamic contrast sequence. So we acquire a serial dynamic contrast enhanced sequences in sagittal plane. And these are essentially 3D gradient sequences and they can be reconstructed in an actual plane later. What we see here is a progressive enhancement of the myometrium here, which is this peripheral part of the uterus. And uh, this is because the myometrium is very vascular and it is it enhances more than the endometrium and also the endometrial cancer. So first we take a zero second, this is a pre-contrast, a non-contrast fat saturation image. And then we acquire multiple subsequent images. Uh, we, here we see a, a, a image at around 30 to 90 seconds or about one minute. This is best to see the, uh, the sub-endometrial enhancement. Not seen very nicely in all cases, but if we see it and if it is smooth and intact and nicely surrounding the endometrium, we can be pretty confident that there is no myometrial invasion. And then this one is a, a phase which is taken at around two to three minutes. So we see that the myometrium enhances progressively and here the myometrial enhancement is seen beautifully. If th this is useful for assessment of deep myometrial invasion. And then this is a delayed phase. This is acquired at typically four minutes and best for the assessment of cervical stromal invasion. Uh, anatomy already covered uh, by <laughs> Palak ma'am. I will not go into any details. I'll just quickly show you that this bright structure in the center is the endometrium. This is continuous with the endocervical canal. Surrounding this is this black structure, which is nothing but the inner myometrium or the junctional zone. And this is continuous with this dark rim in the cervix which is the, uh, the uh, inner fibrous, uh, cervical fibrous stroma. Outside this junctional zone is this thick intermediate signal band, which is the outer myometrium. And this is continuous with the outer cervical interstitial stroma. So it doesn't look so beautiful always. It, in postmenopausal ladies, especially, you, this junctional zone and this eye, outer myometrium, these layers may be very indistinct. And that's when it's difficult to assess myometrial invasion sometimes, and we have to take the help of other sequences as well. Uh, so this is, sorry, this is a typical appearance of cancer. So when you see this, and when you see an endometrial cancer, it looks uh, like an intermediate signal lesion occupying the endometrial cavity. Normal endometrium is bright. Here we can see a part of the normal endometrium seen adjacent to the lesion. 
and this is the junctional zone the dark border which is surrounding it and then this is the myometrium so typically endometrial cancers look hyper intense compared to the myometrium and they look hypo i mean uh, slightly intermediate to dark compared to the normal myometrium the figo stage we all are aware of this this is actually a surgical staging this is not a mmr staging uh an imaging is not a part of it but as per the latest nccn guidelines so they have acknowledged the role of mri now for local regional staging and they recommend that mr has to be performed it's a must for staging before deciding the surgical plan so you can apply this figo staging on mr images as well one thing to note is that in this stage there is no size criteria so we are only talking about the depth of myometrial invasion cervical invasion invasion of the uterine serosa and extra uterine extension involvement of vagina parametrium nodes bowel bladder distant organ etc so we are not really talking about the size the size of tumor in endometrial cancer only has prognostic significance and not staging significance so how do we identify less or more than 50% of myometrium this is very important the first thing that we assess on mr this is always seen on the axial oblique t2 images what we do is we Uh, draw a line parallel to the presumed inner edge of the myometrium and then we drop two perpendicular lines one till the serosa and the other one till the margin of the tumor and the ratio of these two lines is the depth of invasion i'll just show a few examples this one is a 65 year old obese diabetic female with spotting so what do we do next so <coughs> from the history we are thinking of a endometrial cancer maybe of a type 1 variety uh what what was done next for this patient is a biopsy so this is what happens in the uh, real clinical scenario most of the times the patients come to us after they have been diagnosed as endometrial cancer on biopsy so first there are clinical symptoms they go to the doctor they get a biopsy done they have a biopsy proven cancer and that's when they come to us for imaging so what next we obviously will do an mri pelvis so what we see here is this intermediate signal lesion which is expanding and filling up the endometrial cavity the junctional zone this dark rim is seen or here very nicely but it's a bit indistinct here but we do not really see any tumor which is going into this myometrium so this would be a t1 uh, stage 1a that means less than 50% myometrial invasion we can also confirm the findings on the diffusion images and also the dynamic post contrast images another example here we see this nicely seen low signal intensity junctional zone all around with surrounding preserved myometrium we see the diffusion restriction which is filling up uh, the endometrial cavity basically it's the tumor which is restricting on adc it is dark and this restriction is going down into the cervical canal as well but there is no cervical stromal invasion so this is again stage 1a on dynamic uh, we see this smooth uninterrupted band of early sub endometrial enhancement not much role of diffusion when we are able to appreciate the junctional zone all around it and we are pretty sure that uh, there is no myometrial invasion on the basis of t2 and diffusion so this is a case of uh, uh, stage 1b so here this is the tumor this all this intermediate to low signal intensity the junctional zone is seen here on the left side but it's indistinct or or it's we can say it's lost here on the right side so when there is a loss of this junctional zone and we see this tumor definitely invading into the myometrium we are sure that it is more than 1a and when we see the invasion of more than 50% of the myometrium that's when we call it as a stage 1b but not reaching up to the serosa so again dynamic contrast and diffusion also help us in confirming the findings we see an uh this hypo enhancing lesion which is going to the outer myometrium on dynamic this is a 65 year old lady again presenting with bleeding per vagina and a uh, biopsy proven endometrioid grade 2 what we see here is this dark signal intensity tumor which is disrupt which is obviously involving the endometrium and it is going down and it is also disrupting the low signal intensity of the cervical stroma suggestive of cervical stromal invasion and on axial images this is the axial t2 image we see it clearly going uh, into the outer myometrium so there is involvement of more than 50% of myometrium as well so when there is an involvement of the cervical stroma 
we call it as uh, stage 2 so if it had just gone into the uh, lumen of the cervix and it had not infiltrated into the wall of the cervix this would have been stage 1b because of more than 50% myometrial invasion and uh, on contrast we see this irregular enhancement along the cervix so this is tumor confined to cervix and invasion of cervical stroma not just tumor in endocervical canal is the criteria to call it as stage 2 unlike this case where we see uh, the tumor this intermediate signal tumor which is filling up the endometrial cavity and then it is going down and it is go here it's occupying the endocervical lumen but we see this dark ring the dark stromal ring intact so this is not invading the cervical wall or the cervical stroma and this is when we call it as a uh, stage t1 uh then we have stage 3 this is basically tumor which has gone out of the cervix it is uh, involving at least the uterine serosa and it can go out and involve the adnexa as well so here clearly on t2 we can see the junctional zone which is completely lost and the tumor has gone out and through and through it is involving the myometrium and it is reaching up to the uterine serosa and there is an irregular uterine contour as well so on dynamic contrast images also we see all these multiple areas are of thinned out myometrial enhancement uh, and this heterogeneously hypo enhancing tumor which is reaching till the surface of the uterus so invasion of uh, adnexa uh, basically we have to this means that either the tumor has directly in, infiltrated into the adnexa or there is a separate metastatic lesion which is sitting in the adnexal area and the diagnostic clues to in, say that the ovaries are or that next size involved is when we see bulky nodular ovaries uh, with a signal intensity which is similar to the signal of the endometrial cancer stage 3c is involvement of the regional nodes which include the parietic nodes as well unlike ca cervix parietic nodes are considered regional nodes and when do we call them involved either so we follow a size criteria and also a morphology criteria the size cut off for the pelvic nodes so essentially the pelvic nodes are the internal iliac the external iliac and the common iliac nodes the size cut off that we follow are 8 mm for the pelvic nodes and 10 mm for the parietic nodes but we, it is important for us to remember that even nodes if the nodes are smaller than that size cut off criteria they can still be abnormal if their morphology is abnormal that means if if the nodes are round if they are necrotic if they have an abnormal tumor signal and stage 4 is a locally advanced disease so basically what we see is invasion of pelvic side wall extension into the lower third of the vagina invasion of bladder invasion of rectum etc here this is a case with a very ugly looking tumor this was a a papillary subtype of endometrioid type 2 this tumor has not only infiltrated the endometrium completely but it is going down involving the cervix and also the lower vagina this is also involving the parametrium and it has invaded the bladder here as well so to call pelvic side wall invasion the cut off the criteria is that when we see less than uh, 3 mm of uh, space between the tumor and the pelvic side wall muscles which include the piriformis muscles the obturator internus and the iliac uh, vessels nodes i already uh, spoke about it we take into account the size as well as the morphology uh, node positive disease is always a higher grade and poor prognosis disease and it is associated with higher stage uh, role of ct is basically for the detection of distant metastasis so it is a must in aggressive histopathology subtype of cancer and the ct has to cover the thorax and the whole abdomen and the goal is to look for any lung metastasis retroperitoneal nodes and peritoneal disease and it is always performed uh, as a part of the preoperative metastatic workup so just a quick word on synchronous ad uh, adnexal masses versus metastasis these are more commonly so synchronous adnexal masses are commonly associated with type 1 endometrioid variety because type 1 endometrioid are estrogen dependent cancers and high levels of estrogen uh, can lead to hormonally active ovarian cancers which include uh, cancers like thecomas granulosa cell tumors etc 
So these are synchronous cancers and they should not be confused with ovarian spread from endometrial primary. Uh, that because that would falsely upstage the disease. So important to remember is that whenever we have a type 1 endometrial cancer, there is a possibility that we will see ovarian lesions, but we should be careful in calling them as metastasis or spread from the endometrial cancer. So are there any clues that can help us in differentiate between synchronous masses versus metastasis? Yes, there are. And these clues are bilateral ovarian involvement uh, that suggests spread from endometrial cancer. Second, if, if, if the morphology of the ovarian lesions are similar to the endometrial lesions, endometrial cancer. And third, if the ovarian lesion is smaller than the endometrial cancer. So these are some clues that can help us in suspecting a spread from ovary, endometrial cancer and not a unrelated synchronous adnexal mass. Uh, another uh, point is the location of tumor. So this is pretty straightforward. Sometimes on histopathology, it may be difficult to differentiate uh, whether it's a cervix or an endometrial origin. But on MRI, uh, it's pretty simple. So what we try to identify is the epicenter of the tumor. If, the if we feel that the bulk of the tumor is in the endometrium and then the tumor is go also going down and involving the cervix, and especially when myometrium is involved, that's when we know that we are dealing with an endometrial primary. Important to differentiate because the treatment is diff different. If the patient is a surgical candidate, then the extent of parametrial dissection is different for both. A wider parametrial dissection is performed in cervical cancers compared to endometrial cancers. Uh, to summarize the treatment algorithm, now the patients uh, commonly present with endometrial uh, perimenopausal bleed, basically, uh, or abnormal thickening or an ultrasound done elsewhere. And most of the time, these patients undergo a biopsy. So first, so when a biopsy, uh, these patients undergo endo endometrial sampling or biopsy first, and then imaging is performed. And uh, the role of imaging now depends upon the grade of disease on pathology. So the clinical question now uh, is different. If it is grade three endometrioid variety, or uh, if it is the non uh, uh, non-endometrioid types. So these include the serous, the papillary, the sarcomas, etc. If these are other varieties or if it is grade three endometrioid, that means if it, these are aggressive uh, tumors of the endometrium. The role of imaging is to detect, uh, MRI is to detect extra uterine disease. That means uh, nodes and uh, parametrium, adnexa, rectum, bladder, etc. And also a PET CT or CT can be considered for distant metastatic evaluation. But if it is a grade one into endometrioid variety, that means a low risk disease. This is where the role, of, the role of MRI is to detect whether it's an endometrial confined 1A disease versus 1B disease. Because in these cases, if it's 1A, then uh, nodal dissection can be avoided and patient can just go for a uh, total abdominal hysterectomy and salpingo oophorectomy. So this is the treatment algorithm, just a snapshot of the different treatment options that are available. Uh, it's important to remember that surgery is the primary treatment of choice and it has the best outcome. The surgeon will always first want to know if the endometrial cancer is operable or not. And to simplify the, uh, the, the treatment options, uh, so we divide the disease into these three categories. And these three, three categories are uh, based on the pathology grade and the stage on MRI. If it is endometrioid grade one and two, and if it is stage one A on MRI, uh, then it's it's simple. The treatment is going to be surgery. The patient is going to go for surgery and nodal dissection can be avoided. So when I say nodal dissection, I mean the parioteic node as well as the pelvic node. So these nodal dissection can be avoided because these are low risk. And one more option is fertility preserving option. So this can also be offered to the patient if it is a stage one A uh, low grade disease and radiation if the patient is uh, medically inoperable. If it is non-endometrioid varieties, or if it is endometrioid grade three, or if the stage is 1B onwards, so it's 1B, 2, and 3, then again, the patient can go undergo surgery, but this time a lymph adenectomy is must. So the parioteic nodes and the pelvic nodes has to come out. That This is where lies the importance of a radiologist to differentiate between stage 1A versus higher stages. And if it, and of course, if it is stage four, then uh, then the patient cannot undergo a curative surgery, and the treatment options are uh, palliative surgery 
along with node debulking followed by adjuvant chemo radiation so there's a uh, so we see this more often this fertility preservation we see this more often when when young patients are diagnosed with endometrial cancer sorry Obil, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Yes, madam. Uh, so okay. So basically, um, so when young patients are diagnosed with endometrial cancer and they are keen on preserving the uterus to have kids in the future, that's when uh, uh, fertility preservation comes into the picture. This is not standard of care, but many institutes offer it, and there are certain criteria. uh that have to have to be met for it uh, most important being absence of myometrial invasion no extra uterine disease and uh, grade 1 tumor yes yes madam correct please mute the centrally question the faculty yeah okay so to summarize so to summarize uh, it's good to have a checklist in mind so that all the relevant information is covered in the reports and we must this that in panel report is principal sir can you hear me amrun nahar please sorry there's some noise in the background yeah. yes yes so please. this is just i'm just summarizing the the talk uh, with this slide just want to highlight that whenever we report an mri we have this is the information that has to go in the report we have to talk about myometrial involvement whether it is less or more than 50% or whether it is involving the serosa we have to mention uh, cervical stromal involvement present or not the parametrium and the adnexal involvement the nodal stage uh, status and presence of any peritoneal metastasis or any distant metastasis so i will conclude with this sorry my screen is also stuck okay thank you thanks dr oronima patra for your elaborate presentation on role of imaging in malignancies of uterine corpus and its implication on management and uh, i have seen some few questions on the chat box can i ask you yes yes uh, is one is how can we differentiate synchronous cancer from endometrial cancer so endometrial cancer synchronous meaning synchronous uh, synchronous endometrial ovary and acos Ov ovarian right yes yes yeah so basically uh, sometimes it can be a challenge but we can look at so the synchronous cancers are usually on one side if ovarian cancers can be bilateral ovarian cancers spread to ovary second is that if the uh, ovarian if uh, we also look at the histology so if it is a type 2 uh, endometrioid uh, endometrial cancer less likely that it will be a synchronous malignancy it's going to be a metastasis because uh synchronous ovarian cancers are more common uh, are common in type 1 the tumor signal intensity in uh synchronous ovarian uh, cancers will be usually dark those are the thecomas etc fibromas etc uh, uh, so they will show a dark t2 signal whereas uh, a metastasis ovarian metastasis from endometrial cancers they will look t2 intermediate signal which will be very similar to the signal of the primary tumor in the endometrium yes thank you uh, uh, yeah. there is yeah. another question from shana madam madam please uh, before that i want to ask you the question because always we don't because histopathology is after the surgery but before surgery how can you differentiate whether it is metastasis from the endometrium to ovary or otherwise synchronous because sometimes we get patient that today the studio we have get a patient so we have the the endometrial thickness is more than half and bilateral ovarian tumor and also the there was but there was no ascites in that case the patient was a uh, minimum ascites and the the patients the referral doctor she did the staging laparotomy with bilateral sarcoidectomy ovarectomy everything but the final report was the endometrial malignancy with the uh, ovarian metastasis it was also the bilateral and there was the also minimum ascites and but there was no lymphadenopathy in that it is the sometimes we can 
this patient she didn't do the uh, in that cases the always the bilaterally doesn't significantly the causes that is the um, endometrial uh, uh, synchronous correct so bilateral involvement it favors uh, metastasis from endometrial cancer ovarian cancer also sometimes it may be yeah that it, it may be it yeah. may be so one yeah. thing is that whenever in doubt uh, there yeah. is no harm in raising a suspicion of metastasis because yeah. these are patients usually elderly more than 60 to 70 year old so if uh, they will anyways undergo a um, hysterectomy and bilateral salping ophorectomy right she has also the probably she has also the cervical involvement and other things simple hysterectomy yeah then rana please there is another question from you shana madam uh, can you ask or may i repeat that question no, uh orunima we have another question that is sometimes we found uh, myometrial invasion with endocervical growth and how can we image uh, uh, differentiate it this in imaging whether it is endometrial cancer extension or squamous cell cancer of the cervix whether it is uh, okay so uh, do you mean like two di different growths or so we, yeah. if it's a uh, endometrial by imaging only cervix, right uh, Yeah. We know so after histopathology or immunohistochemistry, we can differentiate it by whether there is any uh, uh, tricks on uh, MRI to read out whether it is endocervical involvement, whether it is by endometrium or by the cervix, uh, squamous cell cancer of the cervix. So if we see a tumor in the uh, endometrium, and if it if if it has gone into the cervix. and there is a contiguous involvement it's not a skip lesion in the cervix it's if it's a contiguous involvement and if the bulk of the disease is in the endometrium and if there is a myometrial invasion these are signs of endometrial cancer cervical cancer it's rare to go up and involve the endometrium and also involve myometrium like invasion of the myometrium that is uncommon for cervical cancers thank you we have learned a lot from you Uh, and i am requesting all of our participant if I, if you have any queries please put on the chat please put your questions on the chat box now i would like to request our next speaker dr lakshmi joyshree uh today her topic is post therapy imaging on cervical neoplasm madam please uh good evening everybody uh first of all Uh, can you see my slide yes yeah can you hear me yes ma'am yeah okay uh, first of all i would like to thank the organizers and dr palak uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity and i congratulate the team to for organizing this webinar um, uh, dr palak has already detailed uh, very clearly the anatomy and mri appearance of ca cervix there might be some overlap between her talk and mine uh, i'll be talking on post therapy imaging of cervical neoplasms uh an overview of my talk first i'll be talking about the role of imaging uh the treatment options that are available for ca cervix uh radiation planning and how imaging uh helps in radiation planning normal appearance of the pelvic structures uh, uh on mri and residual and uh, recurrent diseases so role of imaging uh, imaging plays a very important role right from tumor staging uh, in which mri uh, is used for local uh, staging and pet ct for nodal and distal metastasis uh, imaging also plays a role in planning and delivery of radiotherapy in this mri has an advantage that it provides three dimensional imaging of the pelvis so that accurate and targeted uh, dosing of radiotherapy can be given uh imaging is also used to evaluate post treatment complications ultrasound in ca cervix has uh, limited um, use uh, one of the important use is to detect um, genito urinary complications acute genito urinary complications after radiotherapy then uh, mri helps in the assessment of primary tumor response to treatment and in surveillance to detect recurrence so ct might be an easy option for surveillance but then mri has an added advantage it has it gives higher information to stage local recurrence 
So treatment options for CA cervix in a early stage disease that is 1B1 or small volume 2A1 that is a tumor extending to the upper vaginal wall can be treated surgically uh, with radical hysterectomy. In young patients, fertility sparing surgical options include tracheolectomy. This is not very uh, uh, common because in our region, most of the CA cervix present late um, after uh, completion of the family. Concurrent uh, chemoradiotherapy is offered in these patients uh, after hysterectomy if these risk factors are seen in post-operative histopathological specimen, that is tumor size more than 3 cm, invasion of more than 50% stroma, cervical stroma, parametrium, lymphovascular space, or positive lymph nodes. Uh, in advanced disease, like locally advanced disease or distant metastatic disease at presentation, or in patients who are unfit for surgery, concurrent chemo radiation, re -chemo radiation uh, is given. Radiation, uh, there are two forms of radiation, external beam radiotherapy and intracavitary brachytherapy. So external beam radiotherapy gives radiation to the entire pelvis in incremental doses over four to five weeks. And brachytherapy is delivery of localized high dose radiation boost by using implanted applicators. Uh, so imaging and radiotherapy planning, both CT and MRI can be used. That this imaging um, uh, gives way to accurate delineation, targeting, and delivery of required radiation dose for not only the grossly mm -hmm. visible tumor, but also potentially microscopic, microscopic tumor. 4D CT and MRI also take into account movement of the structures, uh, movement of the cervix in relation to distended bladder, distended bubble. All these uh, factors are taken into consideration and the target volume for radiation is planned according to, uh, based on these 3D images. So pelvic ra radiation by default also affects the non uh, 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 structures adjacent to the cervix like the bladder and the bubble. In a brachytherapy planning, ultrasound guidance is um, helps to guide the uh, tandem applicator into the endocervical canal and the endometrial canal. Uh, CT and MRI uh, compatible applicators are available, which has uh, more uh, soft tissue resolution. So, um, if the applicator is out of place or it, it has in, it has been introduced into the myometrium, we can see clearly on a sagittal T2 weighted MRI image, and it can be rep repositioned. If there is breach in the serosa, we call it uterine perforation. Bowel perforation is uncommon with um, uh, tandem applicator, but vesicovaginal fistula is common after brachytherapy. So this perforation is more common in patients who have already undergone a um, course of radiotherapy or there is cervical stenosis due to advanced disease or previous cone biopsy. Extremely retroverted or extremely antiverted cervix, in these cases also it is difficult to introduce the tandem. Second, I think my system. Uh, yeah. So uh, knowledge about the uh, knowledge about normal post treatment appearance of the pelvic structures is very important to know which is recurrence and which is fibrosis after treatment. So after um, hysterectomy, the structure that is left behind is the vaginal vault, which is seen as a linear soft tissue structure with smooth and regular contours. This is the vaginal vault. It, this has T2 dark appearance. It is a muscular, it has muscular walls. So it is hypo intense on T2 weighted images. Sometimes frequently there is a fibrotic scar tissue, which has slightly higher signal intensity compared to normal muscular tissue. So normal post-treatment appearance after radiotherapy. So we can see that this is the, uh, the uh, initial um, scan where there is tumor, there is a mass involving the anterior lip of the cervix. Uh, uh, and here after radiotherapy, there is reconstitution of the zonal anatomy of the cervix. That cervix becomes T2 dark. This is the actual appearance. This is normal appearance of cervix. But there is widening of the T2 dark structure, T2 dark uh, cervical stroma. Further down, uh, um, uh, Further, two years later, there is more fibrosis. There is uh, uh, the demarcation between the anatomical structures in the pelvis becomes less delineated. And also there is fat stranding in the parametrium.
This is an axial T2 weighted image where we see that the cervix has a T2 dark structure and this is the adjacent parametrium. The parametrium has to be clear like this, this fat here, but then we see some amount of stranding that is streaks of T2 hypointense signal extending into the parametrium. Uh, this can up, this can be seen both in fibrosis and recurrent tumor, which is very difficult to differentiate based on T2-weighted image alone. Uh, recurrence. Recurrence, residual disease is what, uh, when the mass is evident within six months of primary treatment, it is called residual disease, but local tumor regrowth or development of nodal or distal metastasis at least six months after the lesion has decreased, regressed is called recurrent disease. So 60 to 70 percent of post-treatment recurrences occur within two years of treatment and beyond and after that up to 90 percent occur within the first five years. Strong um, recurrence predictor, predictors are size greater than three centimeter, adenocarcinoma type, lymphovascular space invasion and deep stromal invasion. The MRI sequences to detect recurrence, there are three basic and most important sequences in an MRI. That is T2-weighted image, diffusion-weighted image, and, the, and its counterpart ADC, and dynamic contrast enhanced images. So the challenge in identifying tumor recurrence on, in, on MRI is differentiating between tumor and post-therapy sequelae, such as fibrosis, inflammation, and necrosis. This diffusion and dynamic uh, contrast imaging that depends on the tumor physiology, the, uh, the tissue physiology, its oxygenation, its perfusion, the cellularity of the tumor, all that plays a part. And we can get quantitative and semi-quantitative parameters which help us differentiating whether it is fibrosis or tumor. And intravenous administration of contrast material and DWI help in distinguishing between this. So this, um, these are the three sequences I was talking about. A normal cervix after radiation treatment will have dark signal on T2-weighted images. There will be no uh, signal, no high signal intensity on diffusion-weighted image, and there will be no contrast enhancement or delayed contrast enhancement will be there. Early contrast enhancement is a sign of recurrence. This is an example of residual disease. We see a heterogeneous signal intensity mass in the anterior lip of cervix extending into the left parametrium. This is after radiation therapy. This is uh, three months after radiation therapy. The tumor has shrunken very much in size, but then we still see a T2 hyperintense soft tissue mass along the left lateral wall extending into the parametrium. And this is the contrast uh, uh, image where there is enhancement of the residual tumor. So this is frankly residual tumor and the, uh, uh, the detection of a T2 hyperintense soft tissue is the most reliable uh, finding to say that it is residual tumor. So uh, recurrence after surgery, after hysterectomy, the most common site for recurrence is the vaginal vault or along the lateral pelvic wall. And in case of, um, and if it is extra pelvic, extra pelvic recurrence, the most common site is paraitric lymph node and in the viscera, lungs, liver, and bone. Omentum is a rare uh, location for a CS cervix metastasis, but there are instances where adenocarcinoma uh, shows my, um, omental metastasis. Although CT can be useful for surveillance, MRI is the most accurate imaging tool for characterization of uh, pelvic recurrence. So this is how recurrence will look on T2-weighted image. There will be a presence of soft tissue mass. The, this is an axial T2-weighted image and this is a coronal T2-weighted image showing a hyperintense soft tissue mass in the right lateral wall and extending into the parametrium. There, there is frank extension to the right parametrium. Uh, T2 cannot differentiate between recurrent tumor and fibrosis in the parametrium. This is a PET CT of the same case there there is avidity in the recurrent tumor and in, a, in an operator lymph node. So uh, in uh, diffusion, dif in diffusion is, uh, is usually red by keeping diffusion weighted imaging and ABC map side by side, a tumor will have will show high signal on DWI and 
corresponding area will be dark on ADC map. But in case of fibrosis, both DWN and ADC will be dark. There will be no high signal on DWI. Inflammation, inflammation on the other hand, uh, will be hyper intense on DWI, but there will be no corresponding fall in signal on ADC. This is how we differentiate between inflammation, fibrosis, and tumor recurrence. And dynamic post contrast imaging early announcement suggests re tumor recurrence. Fibrosis will show mild announcement or no announcement or mild announcement only in the delayed phases. So this is what I was talking about. This is a DWI image and its corresponding ADC coefficient. There, uh, it, there is hyperintense signal on the DWI and it becomes dark on ADC, which corresponds to recurrent tumor. So uh, this, uh, this is a normal appearance of cervix T2 dark. Um, uh, after radiotherapy and here the parametrium shows some T2 high, high, hypo intense signal. So we can see the left parametrium, there is preservation of fat here, but here in the right parametrium, there is some hypo, hypo intense signal on T2. So in this, we cannot uh, say whether it is fibros fibrosis or tumor, but this is a contrast, dynamic contrast enhanced image, which clearly shows that there's no enhancement in the right parametrium, neither on the left parametrium. So this lack of enhancement suggests that it is only uh, fibrosis and not tumor. While the tumor will enhance on dynamic image. Recurrent in the vault. So initially we had seen that the vault is very regular and T2 hypo intense, but in this case there is a hyper intense mass along the anterior wall of the vault which is enhancing on the post contrast image. This is clearly a recurrence. This is another case showing recurrence in the vault. There is the parallel T2 hyperintense is linear T2 hyperintense lesion all along the posterior wall of the vagina. The significant post contrast enhancement on axial section and there is high signal on DWI and corresponding low signal on ADC. So this high signal and corresponding low signal confirms tumor recurrence. And this is the same case after um, radiation. There was recurrence in the vault and radiotherapy was given to that vault recurrence. So on the sagittal T2 se uh, sequence, again, the vaginal vault looks T2. The tumor has shrunken in size. It is confirmed on the axial section. It is T2 hypo intense and the tumor has shrunken. On post contrast study, there is mild enhancement along the left lateral wall. So again, so this is a delayed contrast, there is enhancement. So enhancement on delayed phase can be tumor or fibrosis. This can be confirmed with ADC where there is no fallen signal. So this is continuously of the same signal. signal. So since there is no fallen signal on ADC, this is most likely fibrosis. These are, so I told you about diffusion weighted imaging, uh, dynamic contrast enhanced imaging, these do help in differentiating between fibrosis and recurrence, but it is not so easy with all the cases. Despite all these studies, we still have doubt whether it is only uh, fibrosis or recurrence. So in these cases, biopsy may be warranted. In case of vault recurrence, a trans like a transvector ultra ultrasound guided biopsy is the most feasible and accurate to get adequate samples. USG and CT guided biopsy of lymph nodes and metastatic lesions can be done. And further, uh, if it is not accessible for biopsy, a serial or, or follow up in MR imaging will help. This radiation induced fibrosis will uh, remain stable or diminish over time while recurrence will grow. FDG PET is an important modality uh, for. Uh, detecting distant metastasis or recurrence. Most of the CA cervix are FDG avid with exception to adenocarcinoma, which may reveal low FDG uptake. 
So metastasis, uh, CA cervix at the time of presentation, um, there is usually no metastasis. Metastatic disease usually develop uh, in 15 to 20, 60% of women uh, within the first two years of completing treatment. So patients who present with recurrent disease in the pelvis or with limited meta, uh, distant metastatic disease, for them, surgical treatment like eccentration is potentially curative. Otherwise, with people with uh, eccentric metastasis, only palliative chemotherapy is the option. For lymph nodal metastasis, usually size more than one centimeter for parietic node and size more than eight mm, uh, short axis more than eight mm for a pelvic node uh, is the size criteria to call it malignant on CT and MRI. But uh, apart from the size, T2 uh, high signal, irregular morphology, rounded appearance of node or central necrotic node or nodal group formation. All these are factors suggesting this could be metastatic on MRI. So in uh, detecting nodal metastasis, uh, PET-CT plays a role because PET-CT does not follow any size criteria. Even small nodes, if they are functionally uh, active uh, or hypercellular, they will be FDG able. So this is a metastatic right external iliac node. Um, uh, in, uh, in a scan done in April, this uh, node by MRI size criteria, it was not uh, metastatic, but then there was some T2 high signal intensity. It was still oval. It was not round. It was not heterogeneous. Only thing is that it was like high, hyper intense on T2. This is indeterminate at this stage. We would not call it metastatic at this stage, but a follow-up scan after three months shows an increase in size of this node. It has become rounded and the short axis diameter is more than 8 mm. So this is a metastatic iliac node in a recurrent mass. Disseminated metastasis, so these are metastatic lesions in the brain, mediastinal adenopathy, conglomerated nodes are seen in the mediastinum, liver lesions, all these enhancing lesions are metastatic. And uh, as I told you, mental metastasis is rare, but this was a case with omental metastasis from CSRH. So uh, recurrence, while uh, this is a case in which the local site was clearly, um, uh, there was no recurrence at the local site. You can see there's no uptake, no FDG evidence at the um, cervix. But in the same case, there were large metastatic lesions in the uh, lung, right supraclavicular lymph node. You can see the avidity. In such cases, palliative chemotherapy is given. So after uh, chemotherapy, so much uh, such good response is seen in this patient. These are cannonball metastasis, well-defined rounded opacities seen in both lung fields. The same patient, axial CT section, showing, showing uh, significant resolution of the no, uh, nodules, lung nodules, lung masses after chemotherapy. Recurrence mimickers, post-surgical inflammatory lesions such as granulation tissue, abscess, cicatrization, endometriosis. These can all uh, uh, look like relapse, but um, the diffusion and dynamic contrast help us in, to some extent in differentiating these. And when in doubt, biopsy and follow-up is the only option. Post-therapy complications. So post-therapy complications can, um, can be um, acute and chronic. Uh, this, um, this usually affects the radiosensitive uh, structures in the pelvis, which are within the field of the radiation um, port, portal. And uh, this affects the radiosensitive organs such as the bladder, the bubble, uh, and uh, the hematopoietic bone marrow. So in bladder, in acute... Uh, a bladder presentation, there will be uh, cystitis or radiation cystitis and uh, bladder clot formation. So uh, after radiotherapy, the bladder wall shows edema. The bladder wall is edematous. There will be hyper announcement of the mucosa on CT. And in MRI, there will be high signal intensity in the bladder wall with mucosal bullous edema. This is a common uh, imaging findings this is a common post radiation change in the bladder wall. This will, this should not be termed as radiation cystitis. Radiation cystitis is uh, is when there is when it is clinically relevant. There, there there are features of cystitis and it is on the basis of cystoscopic evaluation with visualization of edema, edema and neovascularization in the bladder. 
sometimes there might be hemorrhagic cystitis that um, occurs as a late complication of radiotherapy and there will be bladder clots bladder clots can be seen as hyperechoic structures which are mobile there will be no vascularity they will be mobile and they are hyperechoic in the gastrointestinal tract the uh, colon rectum and the sigmoid colon are the most commonly involved the ileal loops are the most commonly involved small bubble and these show again just like the urinary bladder this show bubble wall thickening this mucosal enhancement this is a ct of uh, the pelvis showing mm, mm, bubble wall and also circumferential and smooth bubble wall enhancement and long segment uh, how we differentiate it from malignancy is that malignancy will be asymmetrical short segment uh, bubble wall thickening so this is a normal radiation related change and it should not be called radiation enteritis unless asymptomatic patient will not have any symptoms with this appearance but uh, in, in long term uh, this is this is a patient who had a radiation enteritis and uh, for whom uh, small bubble resection had to be done uh, you can see, see an ileal, ileal stoma here uh, again, there is this clumping of the bubble loops and, and other ends, and there is evidence of small bubble obstruction. The dilated bubble loops can be seen here. The chronic chronic uh, radiation related changes are fibrosis, separation of bubble loops, tethering of the bubble loops, and structuring, resulting in obstruction. The, uh, this um, fistula formation is also common common as uh, aggressive uh, tumor growth can also result in fistula formation brachytherapy can really uh, really uh, can result in fistula formation uh, here we can see a necrotic area coming in between the cervix and the urinary bladder uh, and the the and peripherally enhancing and there is air foci within uh, on the delayed scan, we can see that the contrast in the bladder is filling the vaginal vault as well. So here we can see a tract between the urinary bladder and the vaginal vault confirming vesicovaginal fistula. In bone marrow, uh, bone marrow is again highly radiosensitive and uh, radiation will result in necrosis and fatty marrow replacement. The regions of fatty marrow will uh, appear as well de de demarcated high signal intensity on T1 and T2 weighted images and are strictly confined to the radiation field. There is also uh, uh, osteopenia, diffuse, diffuse osteopenia and um, stress fractures, insufficiency fractures, osteomyelitis and osteitis. These are the other complications that can occur in the bone. Yeah, these are my references. Thank you. Thank you, Lakshmi Jastri, for your elaborate presentation. We have some questions in our chat box. I want to share with you. Yes. This one is on PET scan. How do you differentiate it, whether it is metastasis disease or inflammation by PET scan? No, SUV. SUV, a standardized uptake uh, value in a PET scan, it is a quantitative assessment. In If we see a lesion and if we calculate the SUV value, value more than 2.5, I suppose, um, uh, is uh, suggests more of uh, uh, recurrence or metastatic disease. Yes, and, and corroborative findings like uh, soft tissue mass with convex margins. Corroborative CT findings is always helpful in differentiating. You told yes. about something calculation like that, right? Yes. yes uh, it's calculation of something uh, we actually SUV. don't understand. SUV va value, standardized uptake value in the FDG of it area. We can mark a region of interest. We can... Uh, assess the value of it and usually SUV more than 2.5 is considered tumor. Okay. Uh, there is another question. Some, sometimes uh, the inflammatory node sites are more. Uh, then how can we differentiate it that is, it is a uh, inflow involvement or inflammatory changes? Is there any uh, scope to identify by uh, imaging? 
it is difficult it is difficult we might uh, we end up doing biopsies in such cases or yes. we might have to we might have to follow it up and if we don't do not see any local re recurrence or if it, if it is a single node we can we may as well do a short interval follow up and decide and sometimes it is difficult to do fnac from that node then what is yes. your suggestion follow up probably follow up yes mm. if our suspicion is low yes uh, another question in the chat chat box which is ideal imaging to differentiate to identifying recurrence which one is the ideal imaging mri mri is the ideal imaging for local recurrence definitely mri is the ideal imaging okay. ct is not very um, accessible it is not available everywhere and for pelvic imaging and its extent and even to see whether it is amenable to surgery so radical eccentration or anything if there is vault recurrence eccentration is a possibility if uh, all that uh, assessment we can make on mri Uh, and uh, after the treatment of csrv sometimes my patient may present with advanced stage like vault mass with ascites with omental thickening yes uh, does someone want to know how can uh, we identify it, this type of complication by imaging uh, actually the question is not clear to me also i didn't understand samia jabid you can unmute yourself and uh, ask okay okay proceed yes, proceed we are we are we are oh okay. sorry madam and another question from me that is uh, uh, if we, for bone metastasis can we prescribe but suggest bone scan instead of mri yeah if it if if certain in certain cases mri will not as i said in if it is in the patient <laughs> field even the fatty marrow the marrow changes secondary to radiotherapy can mimic metastasis so it might um, mri might uh, raise more questions than it gives answers in that cases pet ct will help us help us to okay. say whether it is metastasis or just radiation related change okay thank you very much and uh, now we move on to our next session it is panel discussion session and this session is moderated by dr vagalakshmi nayak madam uh, now i would like to request our madam vagalakshmi nayak to introduce her panelists to us and begin the session madam please thank you so much so let me share my screen once okay so is it visible Yeah, yeah. Yes, madam. Okay. So I have a very esteemed panelists with me, Dr. Pallak, Dr. Amita, Dr. Supriya Chopra, and Dr. Shrikant. Uh, Dr. Pallak is radi uh, radio uh, radiologist. Dr. Amita is a gynecologist. Dr. Supriya is a radiation oncologist, and Dr. Shrikant is medical oncologist. So we have a whole team of a tumor board now, and uh, we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related to radiation oncology. So we will be discussing topics related Yes, yeah. uh, thank you so much for uh, hosting this panel, Dr. Supriya Chopra. Uh, unfortunately, could not join us, and okay. Dr. Tapas Dora has been very gracious to help us uh, uh, be on the panel today on her behalf. Okay, uh, Dr. Okay, okay. Welcome, Dr. Tapas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Pallan. Bhagya Lakshmi Madam is my teacher, so yes, yes, Tapas. It's a I'm pleasure so to be there. Happy to have you in my panel. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, okay so let me start uh, with uh, this case she was 50 years old and uh, uh, more importantly she was uh, the mother of a uh, medico he was in final year she had a history of contact bleeding for three episodes in two months see i am not going too much into the radiology part of it because we have a lot of gynecologists here so these are uh, real life uh, problems that we face day to day so he, she was seen by a gynecologist outside and uh, mentioned that the cervix was hypertrophied and looked unhealthy and multiple punch biopsies were taken and the histopathology was successful so she was left alone and because the postmenopausal bleeding continued for some time she was again assessed by another gynecologist who did again a repeat ultrasound we showed that there was pyometra and endocervical growth of 3 to 6 uh, 4 cm so she planned for a diagnostic hysteroscopy and a biopsy for the growth 
Unfortunately, patient had septicemia and was in ICU for more than a month. And then with a biopsy report of adenocarcinoma was refer, uh, recovered from ICU and referred to us. And when she came back to us, she had a biopsy report of adenocarcinoma grade 2 uh, with uh, ballooning of the cervix and growth was around 7 centimeters. And both the medial para were almost involved and um, uh, the imaging showed that it was also involved in the lower reference segment. So, Dr. Amita? Yeah, hi. Hi. Yeah. Uh, good evening, so, everyone. Uh, this is a real life situation. So, we really face issues in diagnosing uh, cases uh, like this. So, what is your take on this? So, so this I think one very evident thing is, uh, you know, whenever a patient comes with post menopausal you know, bleeding, just looking at cervix or contact bleeding, looking at cervix alone may not be adequate. In this case, I, I don't know whether ultrasound first time when it was done, was it just yes, trans-abdominal yes, ultrasound? It just showed or a cervix, yes. Yeah, so a trans-vaginal ultrasound with thorough evaluation of uh, endocervix as well as endometrium uh, should be done in all cases presenting with the uh, abnormal bleeding. Also, I think random biopsies were done, but uh, whether there was a, you know, endocervical evaluation was done uh, at that time, I'm not sure. Only no, taking biopsy. Yeah, so that's also an important point. So had that all of that, uh, you know, we have we could have at least managed her little in early stages rather, you know, becoming so uh, a large growth with para involvement and all of that. So we always think that the, uh, if it is a cervix uh, growth, it should be on the ectocervix. So I think we have to understand that sometimes there are lesions hidden in the endocervical canal as well, and they may not come on the ectocervix at all. So I think that has to be kept in mind and many times the pre-invasive lesion. So that's also an important thing because they are most of the time hidden inside the glands. We may be missing them. So I think a thorough uh, workup of these patients is very, very important because uh, I think uh, the first chance was the best chance and we missed it and the patient landed up in so many complications. Right. So the other point is this so-called unhealthy looking cervix. That's very common diagnosis, diagnosis with general uh, gynecologist. I think in such cases, we should have, before taking random biopsies, we should have done a cytology, pap smear, and also uh, a colposcopic examination, rather doing random biopsy with proper endocervical evaluation. And also at this age, endometrium also needs to be evaluated. And uh, do you think that there is an increasing incidence of cervical adenocarcinomas now? That's the perception. Uh, uh, there is slight increase. I don't know whether it's because squamous have gone down, proportionate increase in adenocarcinomas. Uh, uh, but uh, at our center, we see around 15 to 20% of all uh, carcinomas. Is, or, may, or it may be better diagnosis yeah, or could yeah. be that squamous is going down. So we really don't know whether there's absolute increase or um, you know because of other factors. Yeah, we have technologically evolved. So many rare cancers also we are now able to pick up. So right. So previously what was labeled as poorly differentiated carcinoma, uh, you know, that was that was uh, the diagnosis made in the past. Now they try to at least make adeno or squamous. Thank you so much. So growth involving cervix and lower uterine segment. So that was the finding. And uh, uh, fortunately, because uh, he was a medico, so he uh, tried to consult actually you in Tata Hospital. So uh, the patient was at um, yeah, Tata Hospital and then, <coughs> sorry, so there was a growth involving the cervix and the lower uterine segment and all the IHC were done to find out whether it was a cervical growth or a uterine growth, but it was inconclusive. So there was a huge tumor board with all of you sitting together and then still the primary was uh, not sure. So finally, it was according to the epicenter diagnosed as cervical cancer uh, by uh, the whole uh, tumor board at uh, Tata Hospital. So with uh, this kind of growth and a very inconclusive IHC and uh, diagnosing it as a cervical cancer uh, from the imaging. So what would be your uh, next uh, step of management for this patient? How do you manage? What was your plan? 
Hmm. So I think again, I don't remember uh, participating in this joint clinic. But uh, anyway, so what we will uh, do have a, again a joint clinic, and if radiation oncologist think that uh, you know um, lesion looks amenable, so our plan would be concurrent uh, chemo radiation. Uh, of course, I am sure we have done imaging to rule out distant meds because it's rather surprising yes, the yes. way this lesion has progressed within a month's time. Yes. So, uh, if there are no distant meds, it will be concurrent chemo radiation uh, and then evaluation at the end of uh, primary CTRT. Yes. So she received, uh, yeah, and just one issue, but I think we have discussed everything about what could be the issues in imaging in endocervical uh, growth like this. So I think we'll not waste too much time on this. So these are some of the pictures. No, she had chemo radiation and brachytherapy both. Right. At, uh, I mean, yeah, hospital. definitely chemo radiation brachy is a component. Absolutely, yeah. always. Uh, and then us. she came back to us uh, last week, and then she uh, again has a growth of four centimeters sitting on the surface. So that was a really difficult thing to manage. I'll just show in a minute and show you. So there was a uh, still uh, growth which was uh, still there uh, on the surface. So she received the chemotherapy, brachytherapy, and presented after completion of treatment with a residual disease of around four centimeters. So what? Uh, okay. So what, generally, and Tapas may correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, generally, we wait for three to four months before uh, labeling them uh, this disease as residual because radiation effects may take some time. Uh, uh, to resolve. So if after say three months still there is a residual disease biopsy proven and if it is limited to the cervix parametria is free um, after proper counseling uh, I would consider this patient for uh, hysterectomy if possible but we also need to take consent SOS for you know we need to do bladder evaluation make sure that plane with bladder is uh, maintained. Uh, if there is any doubt, then we need to take consent for SOS anterior excentration. So that would be the plan. We will consider this patient uh, for radical surgery. I mean, he's straight to me. Sorry. Yeah. So Tapas, any comments from your side? Uh, yes, ma'am. I agree with uh, Dr. Amita's uh, decision. That is fine for me. This will be too early to take a MRI, say, within, within four weeks of uh, uh, finishing chemo radiation. So at least we take a time of a minimum. Uh, minimum uh, three months and after that we repeat and uh, we can get a pet city also to see the SUV of text and if it's biopsy proven again then I agree it's parametrium needs to be assessed and if it's free then it should be opted for. Okay surgery. so we decide to wait for three months now. so that's yes. what we have counseled them about. So I and just one point Bhagya uh, was P16 I mean uh, yeah. uh, yes. Uh, yes all P16. the markers were done uh, unfortunately I could not get all the uh, reports okay. from him, but all the markers were done because uh, uh, there was a little confusion about endometrium or uh, cervix and uh, uh, like the tumor progressing so fast. So Right. So the only thing is nowadays, you know, with the WHO recent classification of adenocarcinoma, uh, especially HPV associated or independent, all adenocarcinomas, it's, uh, I think, important to do P16. Because we know P16 independent adenocarcinomas have uh, poor prognosis. So I was wondering whether this, uh, you know, lady, the way she has progressed within one month, uh, whether she is P P16 independent. I mean, HPV independent, sorry, not P16. But HPV independent. Uh, have some issues about uh, like, uh, because uh, we do not have very clear cut guidelines about the management of adenocarcinomas because we do not have too many randomized control trials about them. But I think uh, um, uh, in a case of a persistent or recurrent disease, do you feel uh, that uh, there is a role of doing some kind of uh, comprehensive genomic profiling or something? Is there a story uh, in your center? Yes. So as uh, you know, in a research mode, we are looking at it, but it does not really at this point, there's, it doesn't translate in terms of any treatment um, change in the treatment. Okay. So I think there is a scope. If, you, if it is available, we can go ahead with uh, uh, testing for uh, PDL1 and MMR and all those things. Uh, so oh, okay, sorry, you are talking about those. Yes, so that also has therapeutic implications. So PDL1 uh, testing MMR 
we routinely do and we have used immunotherapy in a couple of patients with pdl positive and that is um, you know a decent response to uh, immunotherapy in these patients thank you so much dr shikant are you there yes ma'am Yeah. So, what is your take on uh, uh, chemotherapy as a treatment of choice in this uh, such type of tumors? What is Ma the role? Uh, if it is a recurrent metastatic disease, we would like to plan this. It's patient. not recurrent. Second, it's not recurrent. It's a residual disease, so it was seven centimeter uh, when diagnosed and adenocarcinoma. So, if uh, uh, like the panel has opined, if uh, we have to wait, uh, what is it uh, for uh, three months? If even still it is persistent, if it is a uh, uh, not amenable for uh, surgery, then we would like to plan with a palliative chemotherapy. Yes. So, do you think there is any role of giving chemotherapy at the upfront chemotherapy first, followed by chemo radiation? Some papers are for that. So, any uh, like uh, thoughts on that? Yeah, it depends on uh, how much interval it has been with the uh, past radiation and also concurrent. Uh, radiation related toxicities like radiation proctitis and cystitis associated whether re radiation can be possible or not if uh, it is not possible we would like to go ahead with the palliative chemotherapy okay. yeah. so uh, i think this uh, case also we can discuss role of bevacizumab uh, in in uh, recurrent or metastatic setting right yes ma'am yes ma we could give bevacizumab Yeah. And also, if it is one of PDL those PDL one positive, yes. so we can. If PDL one positive by CPS score greater than one, then we would consider pembrolizumab. Yeah. Okay. So I think uh, there's a new thought that we can differentiate this into intermediate, high, and high risk groups. So which was just recently uh, published, and so that we can plan our treatment accordingly. So I think this is adding. Uh, Uh, chemotherapy to chemo radiation so i don't know whether uh, i think this is still in experimental mode as of now has shown real improvement in uh, uh, overall survival and progression free survival and uh, more than that these are all the uh, very bad prognosis ones and especially the pus jeger syndrome if it is uh, Uh, if it can be found out uh, with the stk11 so that can be done but i think i have to make mention about this uh, review article by dr sudip gupta and dr lalit kumar uh, which has uh, studied so many articles and they have opined that integrating chemotherapy in the management of cervical cancer about 30 to 40% of patients with locally advanced cervical cancer fail to achieve complete response to ccrt so alternative approaches are needed to improve the outcome for such patients And uh, in this weekly paclitaxel and carboprotein for four to six weeks as dosed in chemotherapy prior to chemo radiation should be one such potential approach. So I think in uh, cases where we can uh, understand and uh, uh, see that uh, visualize that this is going to be a very difficult case to manage by only with CCRT. So we can keep our options open, though we do not really have any randomized control trials to support. But then uh, each and every patient is different, so we have to. Uh, think more carefully so now so we have understood that we have to wait for 3 months now and at the end of 3 months we have to assess the patient again and then as dr amita has told that uh, we can go ahead uh, with adjuvant hysterectomy of course after imaging a proper imaging to see that uh, it has uh, no other distant metastases uh, so thank you so much so we go over to the next case so she was a uh, 45 years para 1 with complaints of heavy menstrual bleeding for the last 4 months and uh, she had a mri on uh, 5th of uh, 24th of may we showed a bulky uterus with ill defined lesions predominantly involving endometrium with diffuse myometrial invasion serosal extension cervical stromal invasion left parametrium involved and multiple enlarged and paraortic nodes so i think i have not been able to get uh, very clear images as my radiologist uh, colleagues have but this was the image and this is the report of that and she was worked up thoroughly with a colposcopy which was uh, normal with a pap smear which showed atypical glandular cells her ca125 was 21 and her endometrial biopsy showed a poorly differentiated malignancy with clear cell feature and all these markers uh, were done pas ck plus p53 was 40% Uh, MMR intact, ER, PR, SMA, CD10, Hertonio negative, P16 non-contributory, Vimentin positive, KI67 90% cells positive, and HPV16 18 uh, negative, 
and uh, so looking at all this uh, uh, she already received three cycles of uh, pakli carbo as new adjuvant chemotherapy elsewhere and was then referred back to us so this was uh, this was uh, the hysteroscopy finding which uh, showed us that it had a, a uterine cavity which was filled with multiple tumor and both ostia were not visualized i think you can go ahead so on presentation at ah pgac she had a uh, the uterus was around 24 weeks uh, on palpation and the speculum examination cervix was no, almost normal and vaginal examination again the uterus was 24 weeks and parietal examination bilateral parietal seemed clinically free so uh, when the imaging was done again here it showed that again there were multiple enlarged aortocaval preaortic paraortic retrocaval bilateral uh, common iliac and extra iliac nodes and uterus was enlarged subpleural patches of consolidation and all these findings were there so um, she had subpleural patches of consolidation and in the middle and lower lobe right lung and her protein albumin was also very low so she had already received three cycles of chemotherapy so these are uh, her imaging findings and the bladder uh, rectum were free so we repeated a ca125 just to see and again it was 23 in contrast to 21 which was before chemotherapy and here you can see that there is extensive uh, parametrial infiltration um, extensive myometrial infiltration so there was uh, basically actually no difference in the uh, imaging even after three cycles of chemotherapy okay so uh, with uh, uh, tumor mode discussion in our hospital so she was uh, finally planned for a debulking surgery so preoperatively one bottle of albumin infusion was given and on uh, per operative finding was the uterus was around 24 weeks bosonated deposits involving both ovaries rectosigmoid adherent to the fundus of the uterus both ovaries were enlarged appendix was adherent cervix was expanded the upper vagina also looked little suspicious uh, but there was fortunately no upper abdomen disease and uh, but uh, since the patient was uh, not doing very well so anesthetist uh, did not allow for a, a nodal dissection though we could uh, do a hysterectomy or mental biopsy and uh, following extensive adhesiolysis because there was a lot of adhesion and nodal dissection could not be done. So this is the picture, uterus was 24 weeks, oscillated deposits over the uterus, rectosimulant was adherent uh, with fundus of the uterus, both ovaries were enlarged, appeared inward, appendix adherent and this, this is the gross picture and cut section, there was growth in the uterine cavity extending into the cervix and there was full thickness myometrial infiltration and on the cut section of the ovaries also it was a similar uh, kind of uh, picture and uh, so I think with uh, this finding, so what would be your uh, next step uh, Dr. Amita please? Um, so um, the uh, biopsy again, does it show clear cell poorly differentiated carcinoma biopsy of all of this? We are actually waiting. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. So I think we need to see uh, biopsy and uh, I would be, you know, tempted to do those markers again, although we have already done um, P53 mutant type, I guess. So our plan would be to uh, give chemotherapy, uh, considering she has very poor response to Pakli Carbo. I don't know if uh, uh, we would like to change to another type of chemotherapy or will we continue the same chemotherapy? Uh, and also, uh, are you there, uh, Shrika? Yeah. You can comment. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, generally, there are not much options beyond Pakli Carbo. So we would like to continue three more cycles of Pakli Carbo and uh, assess the repeat scan regarding post-op extent of the disease. Right, and uh, at the end of chemo, uh, we will also consider radiation therapy. I mean, we need to again discuss with radiation oncologists feasibility because looking at things, it looks more, uh, you know, um, uh, not a curative situation. So whether uh, just wall brachytherapy or pelvic RT uh, or extended field that will be uh, called taken by uh, radiation oncologists depending upon because we have to weigh comp treatment related complications versus benefit from this treatment. So, um, uh, Tapas? Uh, yes, ma'am. I agree with the adjuvant chemotherapy followed by I would like to have another imaging of the whole body to rule out if there is any further metastatic or if uh, there is still some regional disease left yeah, behind because for me, it looks like if there will be some residual further, it will be a palliative uh, chemotherapy, basically. If there is nothing in the body, absolutely, we can go for adjuvant EBRT followed by uh, vaginal brachy because it's already more than 1B, so we should have EBRT as well. 
right the looking at the amount of lymph nodal disease she has you know bulky nodes unlikely that uh, these can be co co covered in radiation portal and extensive adenopathy uh, in the upper abdomen yes so. hello dr pallavi there yes i'm there yeah yeah so uh, sorry i didn't involve you in the discussion totally so i think yeah, you have that's... yeah yeah so i think uh, would you like to comment on the uh, imaging uh, imaging that we had this is the pre and post yeah so uh, i mean compared to that so if you just point out to the red arrows that are seen in both the pre and the post the bulk of the tumor which had an uh, you know quite an extra serosal bosculated appearance in the upper aspect has gone down significantly and it is showing less than you know it's showing much more lesser extent of myometal invasion the cervical component of the, of the disease does not have responded so much but uh, you know what i would say is i'm not sure because these are not representative sections if i see the cervical part uh, inferiorly it has not changed much the red arrow on the two sides that shows a different different change but when i see one section above there is a good amount of tumor which is probably still bosculating out and has extra serosal spread so if you go one row above and to your right so that looks like an extra serosal spread so honestly this would need a good comparison section by section to see for uh, a response and similarly about the parotid nodes i think uh, uh, yeah so the red arrow again is pointing to kz uh, not kzating but it's a conglomerated discrete nodes all packed together encasing the great vessels completely and on the ct again it is another section so we cannot compare the sizes as such but if i just look at the dimensions uh, the nodes are extending about 2 cm to the left of aorta and 1 cm right to the uh, to the right of ivc on the ct scan coronal cut again it has a similar kind of an appearance so it may not have responded so once again we need to compare them at uh, equivalent sections to look for response thank you so much so i think so and uh, so the, this was uh, what i collected from the nccl that uh, if she is uh, if because ca125 actually has uh, not been raised at all ca it was only 21 in uh, pre uh, pre nsct and post nsct it was again only 23 so uh, i think yeah uh, but i think there is some doubt about i don't know napsin was not done but uh, could it be clear cell carcinoma so that's another yes, uh, that's yes, a, yes. it's a one of type 2 histologies and may not be uh, papillary serous i'm not sure what is it. so that's why it's important to have another proper biopsy with ihc yes uh, actually when i was doing the surgery i don't know i had an intuition that it could be some kind of sarcoma only because the uterus was uh, so hard to feel it was like uh, i was i am not sure still now what is the biopsy so we can uh, work uh, work more on the ihc and all so again any role of genetic testing in such kind of tumors which has not responded at all to chemotherapy so if uh, it's a papillary serous type of tumor we do uh, braca testing because a small percentage can be braca associated Yes, um yes. and her two yes, new yes. also if it's uh, papillary serous so these two but um, apart from that um, uh, not much so what to new was uh, actually in negative uh, yeah yeah you it was done so yes. all all that markers you mentioned her two new in, even uh, i think uh, pdl1 and mmr1 or everything was negative yeah so this is nt arcade gene fusion i don't know how many centers are doing this yes, yes. Uh, yeah the corporates i think they can advise anything for the patients and the right so sample if the patient can afford sample can be sent to uh, uh, main send outside and they can get it yes. so now i am post op actually she is uh, still in the hospital and uh, recovery is uneventful and only that the protein albumin is still very less, uh, less. and uh, the histopathology is still uh, waiting so we have left behind so much of nodal disease dr shita do you have any thoughts of how to manage this patient after she is uh, discharged uh, i would like to comment ki we should early initiation of palliative care is must here because of seeing the progression of the disease and symptomatic thing 
it would be a uh, poor prognosis uh, should be explained to the patient and i would uh, agree ntrk fusions are found in 1 to 2% of these patients if she is having such targetable mutation then entrectinib and larotectinib are the drugs uh, which can be employed that may produce good response rates yeah, yeah so the cost of uh, ma'am that has to be imported right exactly so we need to uh, discuss that point also and uh, breca testing as we discussed can yes, be done the one which, and uh, we have not done that we can do which is available with us of course ntrk we don't have so breca testing can be done and tumor mutational burden again you have to you know you need to send samples uh, outside yeah. only it's not yes. available yeah yes. so i think uh, Actually, I I wanted to learn for both these cases what best we can do for the patients. So that is why I put both these cases here. And uh, we, um, if biopsy is again it's non clear cell, then we can do ER, PR, and C. But PR, it's, PR is negative uh, at the first before oh, therapy. Okay. Okay. Yes, PR was negative. Yes. It's an aggressive tumor with the uh, I yeah. think. Um, uh, Uh, yeah, sixty-seven, some ninety percent, yeah. and everything yeah. negative. It's essentially what you said is very right. That early initiation of palliative care and counseling yes. is important in this case. So I think we have. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Pallak, Tapas, Dr. Amita, and um, uh, Dr. Shikan. So I think uh, we have two take-home messages from here. That the first case could have been managed if you have evaluated her uh, properly from the beginning itself. so that was a different story and this endometrial cancer is again a different story that she presented up front with a very advanced disease so i think we should have uh, our uh, consider so many things not only evidence we have to the our emotions our intelligence because each patient is different and uh, treat her what best we can uh, give so thank you very much thank you kamaluddin sir dr shana for this opportunity thank you so much so i thank you bhagya very interesting uh, cases and use learning is thanks thank you very much thank you yes yeah. thank you so now, much yeah we are now we are at the end of the session before that the all the credits go to dr palak because she included all the whole area of the india the whole the panelists from all area and the all the getting the all pain the program is arranged by herself before ending the session i would like to request our the scientific secretary dr fm kamaluddin to comment on that today's session dr kamaluddin bhai please so thank you shahana uh, i was amazed to see that at one stage it was 110 plus participation and it is the peak time of our clinic and at that clinic time everybody was sacrificing the clinic and listening to the lecture that means it was a uh, really well done and uh, just for your information the message was sent only 12 hours back we uh, we could not finish everything because i know dr palak was trying to make it best of the best so always she is trying to make it rearrange and shahana and they were doing phd on the whole program i can say because every day i was getting more information this way that way so the information was sent out and some of uh, our colleague was texting me sir i received the message half an hour before so i am sure that the next week will be much more participation and honestly speaking i learned many thing because you know uh, when the image we see we pretend like understanding we clinician we always don't understand everything but when uh, the radiologists are showing these tricks how they see then we learn so i was very i was very happy to see that the radiology was very you know uh, open heartedly without feeling it risky they they took the risk of teaching us to become a radiologist that was i i will say because sometimes they don't show us all the tricks how they understand where is the node where is the invasion so it was really amazing i was really enjoying the thing and i'm sure the next week will be more interesting and thanks to amita bhagga and dr tapush for giving the time and i think this was an interesting idea to blend the radiology with the clinical tumor board because initially i was not in favor of this idea i was arguing with shahana but when i heard amita suggested it i accepted it and now i realize it was a good idea thanks amita for the wonderful suggestion and hopefully we'll have more session on next two weeks and if we find like always we say that this is uh, there is interest we may carry on something similar program on more focused on general specific sites because there is no end of learning thank you very much to all 
and we enjoyed. See you all next week. Thank you. Thank you, Conway. So we you request you all to participate in the next session. I think we'll do more uh, participants in the next session. Now we'd like to end the session the, from 5 p.m. The Dr. Palok is already with us and all the participants and all the faculties. Now I request our president, Professor Dr. Yemi Haisar, chairperson of the two-day sessions to conclude the session, sir, please. Over to you. Thank you, Sana. <clears throat> it was a great session. You see, back where I could attend such session 40 years ago, I could have been a better uncle again. However, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Dr. Palak. Faculties, you were very kind to us. Hopefully, we shall see you next week. Now, with all your things can be taken care of. Them. In this session. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye, bye. bye. On my side also. Thank you so much.